are calling to order the meeting of the Arlington Select Board for Monday, February 22nd, 2021. As a preliminary matter, this is John Hurd, the Select Board Chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan? Yes. Steve DeCourcy? Yes. Len Diggins? Yes. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Adam Chapdelaine? Yes. Douglas Heim? Yes. And Board Administrator Ashley Meyer is participating remotely. Good evening. This meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth, given the outbreak of the novel coronavirus, in order to mitigate the transmission of the virus and reduce risk of COVID-19 illness, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to participate entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Even if members of the public do not provide comment, participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. For this meeting, the select board is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please also take care to adjust your screen or device name if you would like to speak. In order for us to recognize speakers appropriately and develop accurate minutes, it is helpful for our participants to see your full first and last name when calling upon you rather than a nickname. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are being are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend the members and public follow the agenda as posted on Novus unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. We'll introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comments, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. This meeting will feature opportunities for public comment on certain items. After members have spoken, I as the chair will afford public comment opportunities as follows. I'll first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once the chair has a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Please keep in mind that all participants and members of the public must be recognized by the chair before speaking. Finally, each vote taken will be a roll call vote. All right, and that takes us to the next item on our agenda. We have a vacancy on the board due to Joseph Caro's resignation. So we have an appointment to, uh, for an interim select board member term to expire April 10th, 2021. So for this, we'll Mr. first. Chair. Yes, Ms. Mahan. Um, if I could move to open nominations as well as um, invite our town moderator, Mr. Leone, to join as, panel, as a panelist and voting member. Yes. And if there's a second. Second. Ms. Leone, can you hear us? All right. Good evening. All right. And 
as is customary, the remain the open seat is filled by a vote of the select board along with our moderator, Mr. Leone. So as we've done before, and uh, we've done this a few times in the past few years, we will op we have a motion to open eight open nominations that's been seconded. We will take nominations from the board. We have uh, letters letters of interest from three individuals. We have Mr. Dan Dunn. We have Mr. Gordon Jamison, and we have Ms. Sandra Mustajo. And if any individuals are re received nominations, we will then promote them to panelists for any comments or questions from the board, at which point we'll, we'll take a vote on that individual's appointment. So if- um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I'm not sure, it's just housekeeping. Does Attorney Heim have to take a roll call vote on my motion or can we just proceed into it? Nope, we're gonna vote on it. I just want any question for Attorney Heim before we start this process. All right. So Attorney Heim, we have a motion to open nominations that has been seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's so unanimous vote to open nominations. Thank you. All right, with that, I will open it open to the board for any nominations that they wish to make. Oh, I guess. Mr. Diggins. Yeah, I'm so used to raising my hand, you know, um, with the, the, um, the hand button. Uh, so um, I would like to nominate uh, Mr. Jameson. And can I say a few words in the process of nominating him? Sure. Or, or, or should I wait until later? So you, you can say a few words as to why you want to nominate Mr. Jameson. OK, you know, so. Yes, uh, Sure, sure. I mean, um, so um, I am, um, you know, I I'm just very impressed with uh, Mr. Jameson. Uh, I have attended, I attended a, a fiscal resources task group meeting, and and I, I was really impressed with his breadth of knowledge. I mean, and I have seen him at town meeting uh, over probably the last seven or eight years, and there are a lot of town meeting members that can get me to change my mind, and he is one of them and I just have tremendous respect for his um, thinking ability and his reasoning. So uh, I, um, in adherence to open meeting laws, uh, I wanted, I, I, let me just say, I wanted to bend over backwards, me to adhere to open meeting laws on this one. And, uh, and, and so I didn't contact anyone. And, and so that's why um, I decided to nominate him. So thanks for listening to me. So we have a nominee. Nomination for Mr. Gordon Jamison. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a second. And do you have any additional nominations, Mr. Corsi? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to nominate Mr. Dunn um, for, for the interim position. And um, we, well, several of us have, have served with him. He has been uh, elected as a member of the board on, on several occasions. It's a, it's a short term appointment and uh, he has indicated that he is has no intention of running for office in, in the future um, and as, as a former member um, given this short period of time I think his experience will be very useful to the board so for that reason I'm I'm nominating him all right thank you do we have a second I have a second a second and we have a second for Mr. Dunn all right, and do we have any additional nominations at this time? All right. Can I just ask, was that second from Mr. Dunn or Mr. Diggins? The second was from Mr. Diggins. Sorry, I my computer's not yep. focusing well. All right, and with that, we will take a motion to close nominations. So moved. From Mrs. Second. Mahan, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. 
Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Shannon's vote to close nominations. I'm Mr. Leone. I apologize. I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Leone. Uh, I second the closed nominations. I wasn't sure if I actually had a vote during this part of the process. And no, I, just, I apologize. Yeah. That's my fault. Um, so yes, Mr. Leone is a part of the board's appointment uh, vacancy process. I should have uh, included Mr. Leone in previous previous uh, votes. Uh, so Mr. Leone's affirmative vote is unanimous vote. All right, so I'll ask Mr. Chaplain if you could promote Mr. Jameson and Mr. Dunn. All right, we'll start with Mr. Jameson. Mr. Jameson, if you could just give us a minute or two about your interest in the position and why you'd like to serve for the next few months until April 10th on the suck board. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, <clears throat> so um, Mr. Diggins approached me um, a couple weeks ago about this and I, I was honored to be um, considered for the uh, position. Um, I've lived in town for uh, almost 19 years since 2002, and I have um, I'm, I've been a town meeting member. I'm in my sixth term as a town meeting member, an active one, as the board members um, probably recognize. Um, I was uh, co-chair and chair of the Re Arlington Recycling Committee for 12 years, um, during which time the town's uh, uh, tonnage that was incinerated was reduced by about 30%. Um, overlapping with that and for the past 12 or so years and continuing on as Mr. Diggins mentioned, I've been um, co-chair and co-chair of uh, Envision Arlington's physical resource task group. Uh, several issues um, that we considered in that group have uh, come before the board as was also true for the recycling committee. I've been involved in a variety of other um, campaigns, overrides and um, uh, including initially when I moved to town, um, helping uh, work on the community rebuild of Robin Farm Playground. So um, I think I have a, a good in, good um, consideration. Of course, Mr. Dunn has much more experience than I, and so um, uh, I would not be surprised if the board um, uh, um, went with Mr. Dunn. Um, and thanks, I want to thank Mr. Diggins again for the kind uh, invitation to uh, serve the town in this manner. I always say that's why I don't un, that's why I don't mute myself. I'll open up to the board and Mr. Leone for any questions. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, no, thank you. Mr. My only, oh. I th thank you, Mr. Chuan. No questions. I just want to thank Mr. Jameson and actually thank all three individuals who contacted us for their interest in serving. Thank you. Mr. Leone. Uh, Mr. Jameson, do you have any interest in running for the board at any point in the future? Um, I thought about it in the past. Um, I'm pretty happy with this, um, my role at Envision Arlington and uh, other roles in town as town meeting member, perhaps in the distance future, but it's not something that um, is on the horizon for me now. I have other business concerns and things to worry about. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Uh, no questions. Thank you. All right. And I just want to thank you for your interest. So with that, I'll turn to Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn, if you could just give us a minute or two about your interest in serving the interim position on the select board for Mr. Carroll. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, thank you for uh, the question. Thank you for the nomination. Um, I just think it, I can do a service to the town by uh, performing the role for a short period of time. Um, I I've obviously know the role. I've, you know, I did it for a little more than nine years, unexpectedly nine years and two months because of the way the election ran uh, last year. And uh, I think that the board has had a practice in the past of putting on past members because it's who don't plan on running because it's non-controversial and it's uh, quick to getting up to speed. And, and that makes sense to me. Um, so if I can be of service, I certainly will. Okay, right. thank you. I appreciate it. Mrs. Mahan. 
Um, along with Mr. Jameson, thank you, Mr. Dunn, my former colleague for uh, uh, stepping up to the plate. Uh, I never thought when we were meeting back in kickstand back in 2019 that you thought I wouldn't be on the board right now and I didn't think you, you might perhaps be coming back on the board. Um, so I kind of have to note that. Uh, but um, I think both you and I still have the patience needed to listen to people, um, as you pointed out when we had that meeting there. Um, I, I certainly have continue to have the fire in my belly and obviously you do uh, to do that. So uh, depending on how this vote goes, uh, perhaps those what you thought were prophetic words um, will not come to light. And perhaps both you and I will once again be on the board, which is probably something that you never envisioned. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, no questions. And as I said to Mr. Jameson, thank you, Mr. Dunn for your interest in serving um, over this next uh, short period of time. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Uh, same question. I know you're on before Dan, but uh, you ever gonna try again? Uh, I'll never say never because, you know, never is a long time, but I can, I, I, as I wrote in my letter, I have no plans on running. Very good. Thanks. And Mr. Diggins. Yes. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Dunn, I have to say, after um, being on the board two extra months, I thought that had I approached you, you would have laughed at me. So I didn't, I didn't expect you to, 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 um, to, to, to go for it. I am thrilled that you are. You know, I'm also thrilled that I asked Mr. Jameson and, and I, I will uh, vote for him because I feel that I should extend that courtesy. And I'm so happy that he did uh, apply because we, I was so impressed with your, um, your professional experience and, and seeing your background <laughs> is what uh, makes me understand why I have so much respect me for your, um, your, um, your thinking abilities be, but um. I, I, there's no losing here as far as I'm concerned, you know, what's going to happen with um, the interim position. So, so I'm excited for what's about to transpire. Thank you. All right. And again, thank you for your willingness to serve with that. We're going to send you guys back down um, and just have a little discussion here. So thank you both. Thank you. I'm Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, is it my understanding that after the vote of this board, the uh, successful candidate will be sworn in by the town clerk and then join us later? Or how, what's the mechanism for that to work? So the town clerk is available in that whoever is so successful, we'll let them know that the town clerk has their contact information. The town clerk will be reaching out with materials to provide them and give them the opportunity to be sworn in. And if they're able to then return to the meeting, they'll be able to do so once they're sworn in. And um, if I could ask the chair or attorney Heim, um, if the successful interim select board member does not have the information to contact our town clerk. Is that something we can post on the chat feature and or uh, uh, text that individual so they can accomplish that part and join us after that for the Warren article hearings, if not sooner. Hey, uh, Madam, uh, Ms. Mahan, what I would propose to do is I will put uh, my extension uh, in, the, um, in the chat uh, the successful candidate can call me and I will connect them to the town clerk if they would like to be, they don't have to be uh, uh, sworn in so that they can participate in the later aspects of this meeting. So last question, um, is it my understanding that if they're not sworn in tonight via technology, they can um, perform their duties as an interim uh, select board member and be sworn at a later date. My big thing is when we get to the warrant article hearings, will they have standing whether they are or are not sworn in by the town clerk tonight versus another day? Sure. So the, the thing that I guess I would just also make clear for the members of the public is that um, the sort of 
sense of, I guess, urgency, if you will, is that for the uh, interim member of the board, uh, the board report produces one report and produces votes and comments. Uh, so the uh, ideal situation would be that if somebody can be sworn in and be available for Warren Oracle hearings, they can participate in that process and vote on Warren Oracle hearings after having heard the uh, presentations by all the folks today, uh, who I think are mostly resident petitioners and one or two committees and commissions. Um, if the person is not available, it's not a big deal. Uh, we can um, swear them in, you know, in, in, the, in the more conventional fashion and they just join the board for its next meeting. Okay, thank you. So for them to participate tonight, there needs to be that connection with the town clerk tonight. They and need to be sworn. Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Ms. Mrs. Mon. Yep, all right. Yep, I think we, we have that, okay. So now we'll take a vote. To, Attorney Heim can correct me or add anything you need to, but we'll just take a vote where we go down the line of the five voting members here, and you can vote one, which of the two individuals nominated you'd like to vote for to be to fill Mr. Carroll's spot. We just need a simple majority. So with five voting members and two nominees, it should just take one round of voting and whoever has the majority of the votes will be appointed to the board, to the interim position. Is that correct, Attorney Hyde? That's correct. As long as someone gets three votes, uh, you won't need to go to another round. All right. So with that, we will get right into it. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Mm. Mr. Dunn. All right, we have one for Mr. Dunn. Mr. Corsi. Uh, Mr. Dunn. And yeah, Mr. Leone. Mr. Dunn. And yeah, Mr. Diggins. Mr. Jameson. And I will vote for Mr. Dunn as well. So that is four votes in favor of Mr. Dunn and one in favor of Mr. Jameson. So Mr. Dunn has been so appointed. Um, so Ms. Chapley, can you bring Mr. Dunn back up? Mrs. Mahan, I just want to make sure. Can you hear us? Uh, sorry, sorry, my computer's gone down. Yep. Um, um, if you get, uh, we're voting on Mr. Dunn now. Nope. So Mr. Dunn's been appointed. I just want to make sure you could hear us because I couldn't see your video. All right. So Mr. Okay, Dunn, sorry. congratulations. You have been appointed to the interim position. Um, I assume you heard the uh, town clerk, Mrs. Ms. Brazil, is available to connect with you. Um, and so if you are able to get in touch with her, you can do so, you, she can swear you in. And then whenever you are sworn in, you can just come on back to the meeting. Once we see you back on the in the meeting, we'll uh, we'll promote you back up to panelists. Mr. Hart, I've, sorry. Yes. I've shared my cell phone number with uh, Mr. Dunn by the chat if, if he needs it. Yep. All right. I will be, uh, I'll be right back. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Dunn. And with that, we also thank Mr. Leone for his service in the process. Mm -hmm. I'll see you later tonight. All right. All right, so that will bring us to item number three on our agenda. Review and approve bond issue, bond anticipation note and related matters. Determination of maximum useful life of capital asset purchases and installation to be financed. Award sale of the $77,845 general obligation municipal purpose loan of 2021 bonds of the town dated March 11th, 2021 to Janie Montgomery Scott LLC at the net interest of 1.77%. Award sale of the $100,000 general obligation bond anticipation notes dated March 11th, 2021 to Century Bank at the net interest of 0.55% in all related documentation required to execute, execute the sale. We have Mrs. Phyllis Marshall, our town treasurer with us for any additional matters, as well as our deputy town manager, Mr. Pooler. 
Ms. Marshall. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to announce that we got a remarkable interest rate on the uh, $77,845,000 bond issue. Um, we had nine bids and they were all within 0.28% of each other. And um, we are, last year when we issued bonds, 15 months ago, um, the rate that we were very happy with at that time was 2.69. So this interest rate is um, great. It's a sign of the AAA rating of the town and the um, market. Um, we um, uh, are, are very happy that the AAA rating was affirmed. And um, so um, I, um, I'm happy to speak to any of the questions anyone has. The, the item for um, maximum useful life is the result of four items that are listed in this um, vote of the select board that are technically equipment and under the statutes, uh, equipment has a useful life of five years. Um, we, the, the projects for the Audison, the HVAC rooftop units and the elevator are sometimes considered renovation work. Um, in this case, they are not, they are equipment. And so uh, you are being asked to vote on the useful life for that, for those two items of 10 years. And the other two items also equipment in this case. Um, I uh, spoke with uh, Mike Rademacher from Public Works in Arlington, the useful life for a boom dump chip truck is 15 years. Um, and um, the same was true for the bleacher lift, which is, um, I spoke with Joe and he indicated that the, um, he was comfortable that that was certainly the useful life or more for that lift at the rink. Mr. Pula, did you have anything additional to add on that? Uh, no, I just, I think this is, I would just add that I, this is one of the lowest bond interest rates I have ever seen in my life. Uh, and we had a lot of bidders. Um, so I think the, um, it will save uh, the town um, about $300,000 a year on the uh, capital side, uh, capital planning side, and about $400,000 a year on the um, high school side. All right, thank you. And I will turn to the board for any questions or comments or motions. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I will move the votes as contained in the report that uh, Ms. Marshall uh, provided to us in the packet. Um, but I, I, I wanna say congratulations to the town manager, to Mr. Pooler and Ms. Marshall for the, uh, for the great job because the, the AAA, AAA rating is, is uh, really um, really impressive and uh, the comments in the ratings report are equally impressive in terms of the, the view of management and uh, especially the view of the um, town's ability to uh, engage in budget flex budgetary flexibility it seemed that that really impressed the the, uh, the ratings agency so congratulations on a job well done thank you thank you mr diggins Yes, I will second that and, and echo uh, what Mr. DeCourcy said. Uh, uh, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that raise report was really very good. It, uh, it, I was a little questioning about the, the first point you know, about the um, economy uh, being strong, the Arlington economy being strong, because I was like, well, how is anything, any place, any place is economy strong, but they gave their justification later on. Uh, so I understand to the rationale of uh, the section on um, post employment, other post employment benefits was a little, um, uh, it's an eye, not an eye opener. Uh, I mean, we're aware of it, I mean, but it was interesting to see it from their point of view. I think this will be good. It's good to have this outside perspective of things and I think it'll, it can serve as well in discussions later on when, when we have more budget conversation. Uh, I just had one, technical question 
it, uh, I think I know the answer to it, but uh, you can clarify for me. I think it's on the, um, the continuing disclosure certificate. At the very end, it says in exhibit B that uh, there was a notice of failure to file an annual report. Is that just a timing issue that maybe it's occurring at a point where it takes some time to do the annual report? I just didn't understand why that's there. This is exhibit B. Um, I Mr. Chair? Yes. Sorry. Um, I, um, I will check into it. Uh, it. The annual report is required to be filed um, in March. And I was very happy last year because I was one of the first towns in. So I, I'll, I'll check on that um, yeah. and, and verify what annual report they're referring to. Because um, we're getting ready uh, to prepare for this year. Uh, right. And we're all set because we just issued debt. So um, our uh, annual report should be good to go with the official statement that the final official statement that was posted on the webpage yet today. So I will check into that. Okay. I, I was just curious. I mean, don't, don't spend any time. Clearly it's gonna fly through with me. So, so um, all right, thank you. I will note for the minutes that Mr. Dunn, who I assume has been newly sworn in to the select board has now joined us. Thank you very much, everyone, for your faith in me. And yes, I have been sworn in. Thank you. All right, uh, Mrs. Mahan. Um, just, I think, two questions and perhaps a request for a comment. Um, and this the question is not in any way a criticism. I just want to have clarity for myself. In terms of the... Um, General obligation um, bonds at 1.77% and the um, general obligation bond anticipation notes at 0.55%, uh, um, which are both great rates. Um, am I correct that the difference in the two has to do with the amount that we're requesting to be bonded when you're going from 1.77 to 0.55? And also for Ms. Marshall, um, I'm assuming that all documents related to um, execute the sale do not have a, mo a monetary uh, value assigned to it. And then I have a question for Mr. Kula. Ms. Marshall? Uh, the first question, is, uh, the first answer is that um, the under the ban bond anticipation note, we're only borrowing 100,000 for three months. So um, I think it was, um, the size of it and also the term uh, that garnered that really low interest rate. Um, it's pretty um, short window. Um, so there's fair, there's really no risk um, on that one. Um, 30 years is a, a bit of a longer risk, but I'm very happy with the rate. Um, and um, I believe- And then my second question, the last um, part of the vote is, um, all related documents required to execute this motion that that does not include any further monetary items. No, the, the documents that were required to execute for the bond are, um, we will pay for the cost of uh, bond counsel out of the proceeds. Um, those are eligible for the premium expense and um, so that will that will be um, paid for out of the premium that we receive. Okay, thank closing. you. And then, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And then um, I don't know if it's a comment or a question to our deputy town manager and our town manager um, regarding. I know through the long range planning committee, we've uh, Charlie Foskett made a presentation and um, the board accepted the task to look at uh, a possible future override, which we promptly turned over to the town manager and deputy town manager to sort of undertake that task and, and come back with uh, possibilities. Um, if, if this is something, Mr. Pooler or Mr. Chaplain, you can't give an answer on right now, I totally understand, but um, in light of uh, the short-term months and long-term 30 years borrowing and the uh, percentage rates that we have here, is that something that um, 
you're factoring into what will come back to long range planning or is it something that you're going to do worst case best case scenario like can this uh 0.55 1.77 if i'm saying that correctly um is that a trend we can look towards or you're still looking at that a any comment you can give on that mr pua uh thank you mr chair um the numbers that we're talking about here are all within the realm of our capital planning, which as I think you all are aware, uh, makes up uh, for our non-exempt at 5% of the budget. So when uh, we have a good interest sale such as this, it gives the plant capital planning committee a little more flexibility as to what things we can get accomplished within that capital plan. Um, so when our borrowing is cheaper, it gives us a little more money to pay cash for some other things, all within that 5% cap. On the uh, exempt side, on the high school side, uh, what it will mean is that the amount that we have to put on the taxpayers, which they voted for a debt exclusion to support, will be uh, somewhat less than we originally anticipated. So it will, over the next 30 years, continue to save our taxpayers money on their annual real estate bills. Those will be the two effects that I see. Okay, and then I guess my last um, um, comment on that would be, last two comments is <clears throat> moving forward with long range planning, whether it's town school properties, how we can sort of guesstimate out what the interest borrowing rate is, and then I would leave it to our town manager uh, in terms of um, the debt exclusion for the high school, where it sounds like it's not going, there's gonna be some cost savings that are not the max that it could be. I think that's a message we need to get out if um, my colleagues in the town manager deem appropriate. Yeah, I, I think that is, I think that is fair. I think it is something to celebrate and to um, to inform taxpayers and voters about. So I, I think that's a good suggestion. Okay, thank you. Just where we're in the very infancy discussions of a possible um, impending override that um, we, as we have done consistently in the past, demonstrate to the voters that um, where there are cost savings, similar to the water sewer debt shift and property taxes, trying to level that off that uh, this is, we can note this demonstration that um, we're doing everything we can to uh, take the will of the voters, but also um, take the pocketbooks or wallets of the voters and make sure we're not um, reaching into it more than we need to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Mr. Dunn, do you have any questions for Ms. Marshall or Mr. Buller? No, thank you. Thank you. All right, and I would just reiterate with the comments from the board that when I saw the, I know I'm in the real estate industry, so I know the rates are low, but when I saw those rates, I almost thought that they must be a typo. So that's certainly excellent work. Um, so with that, I, we had a motion by Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. Diggins, did you second the motion? I don't recall. I sure did, Mr. Hurd. No problem. And I'm happy to remind you. By, of course, seconded by Mr. Diggins, Attorney Hine. Mrs. Vaughn. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous yes. vote. All right. And thank you both. All right. And that brings us to our ne the next item on our agenda presentation Community Preservation Act Committee by Eric Helmuth, the chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Community Preservation Committee, Act Committee, sorry. We have Mr. Helmuth. Now, now would be a good time. I did get a, a note from a resident asking me to announce at some point during the meeting how many participants we have. So as of right now, we have 66 participants in our meeting. All right, Mr. Helmuth. Welcome. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? We can. Good. And uh, could I ask the chair's permission to also uh, promote uh, Clarissa Rowe in case uh, she needed to respond to questions? Yep, absolutely. 
Thank you very much. I'll switch to my slides here in a moment. Uh, so hello, I'm Eric Helmuth, Chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee. Yeah, we used to be the Community Preservation Committee until we realized the initials were CPC. We had one of those with the Capital Planning Committee. So a couple of years ago, we inserted the A and the rest is history. So thank you for inviting us uh, to, to present. Uh, the bylaw for the Community Preservation Act Committee uh, stipulates, I think wisely, that although the committee presents its recommendations for projects and other budgets directly to town meeting by state law, that we consult with the select board, the finance committee and the capital planning committee. And we found that to be a really good idea because it's an opportunity to inform you and the residents of the town what their tax dollars are doing uh, for CPA and to solicit your feedback and questions because that makes us better. And we hope uh, to also solicit a vote of support at some point should you deem that uh, appropriate. So from that, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And uh, I believe I need to have that enabled, actually, uh, whoever's hosting the meeting. Mr. Chaplin. And... All right. Here we go. Just give me just a moment to launch this. Right. Apologies. All right, here goes. All right, you should see a slide presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We'll skip the introductions. So these projects are in budget are for fiscal year 22 that we'll be voting on at town meeting. As you may remember, the Community Preservation Act uh, takes a 1.5% surcharge from the property taxes of the residents, combines it with matching, matching funds from the state community preservation fund to fund projects in three areas, historic preservation, open space and recreation, and community or affordable housing. The projects tonight uh, run the gamut of those and cover a lot of the town. And uh, I know that you have a long agenda. I'm not gonna go to a lot of detail tonight. I will point out for you and for the residents uh, watching that we publish the complete applications for these projects, which include budgets and timelines and voluminous letters of support from the community to the Community Preservation Act's webpage, which is arlingtonma.gov slash community preservation. And uh, I would encourage you to check that out for all of the details as I'll just be doing a high level view tonight. So our first project we'd like to talk to you about tonight is from the Arlington Housing Authority. We did some work at Drake Village, which is a senior housing facility here in town, uh, earlier on the Hauser building to work on the building envelope, specifically the window restoration in one of our first rounds of CPA funding. And this year they've come to us to ask if we would help uh, with a, to fund part of a uh, major project to re renovate the nine uh, other buildings in the complex. These are two story buildings. I believe there's uh, some eight units each. And specifically, they asked us to help with the doors, and this slide shows why. Uh, CPA funds need to work to preserve the building and the structure so that that housing, affordable housing, remains available in the community. So this modest grant would fund the, uh, the replacement of steel doors, and there's quite a, quite a lot of doors uh, across the nine buildings, each building, so that's why uh, it, uh, it adds up to what it does. So we're very happy to do that. Very glad that they came to us for that assistance. They have a much larger budget for different phases of the project. They're funding some of this with their own budget reserves and some additional grant money. So we're glad to, once again with CPA, it's not a lot of money per year, but we're really happy when that can fit into a, a larger funder, funding package and leverage the local investment from Arlington taxpayers uh, with other state and federal funds. So our next project is $27,000 in change to the Somerville Homeless Coalition for work I must emphasize in Arlington. Uh, those of you on the board are well acquainted with the excellent work that this or a nonprofit organization does for the town of Arlington to support uh, people living here who are formerly homeless and, and or disabled and to uh, preserve their ability to remain in housing. So what this grant does is uh, enable the Homeless Coalition, which rents 25 apartments all across Arlington, and these are market rate apartments, 
the nonprofit achieves, uh, obtains federal funding to subsidize the cost of that so that the people who are staying in these apartments only pay what they can afford. But right now, due to some problems in, in, in varieties of uh, federal federal funding, there's a gap between what the federal fund subsidy will cover and the market rate that the landlord need in order to keep providing that housing. So this would uh, support uh, that gap for 25 apartments and support um, um, 43 different individuals who are living there and keeping them in housing. The Homeless Coalition does an active job with case management and uh, ensuring that the wellness needs of these individuals are met and that they are fully supported in the housing. They've had a tremendous track record of success and we are very pleased that they came to us this year for assistance. Moving on to the open space and recreation uh, project. And by the way, when I get to the budget page, I'll talk a little bit more about the overall affordable housing portfolio. So remind me if I haven't, if I didn't get there. So uh, prior rounds of CPA funding have done extensive renovations to um, the Spy Pond Park area, um, the shoreline restoration and the erosion prevention. Uh, this is a small piece of that that actually didn't get funded just because of the, the, in, the in budget and the uh, cost overruns that, that come with any public project like this. So this is an opportunity to pick up and restore this. Uh, the rest of the, of the surface area there um, is now looks nice and new and shiny with porous pavement. And this is still a very old uh, ramp got down to the park. So this would be replaced with that material and uh, do a lot, do an even better job for rainwater absorption and for erosion control. So just complete the job. And now to one of our largest projects and, and one that we are actually really happy to be able to do. Uh, the herd field is, I uh, just showed it on the map so people can see, uh, see where it is. Uh, one thing that you might not recognize, especially if you're at Trader Joe's, is how close this really is to the Arlington Reservoir and what opportunities there are recreationally if those can be better connected. Um, and that is part of the vision of this project. So uh, I think it won't be a surprise to any of you that Herd Field is really decades past uh, a, a much overdue renovation. Anyone who has played there or used the park is well aware of this. The playing field has terrible drainage, the uh, weeds, um, it needs complete turf, it just needs to be completely redone. The fences, the benches, the dugouts, everything. The electrical panel is, is iffy, <laughs> as you can see here. It's still, they would not operate if it weren't safe, but it's nearing the end of its life. Um, and you know there are other conditions that again, that are no surprise to anyone who's walked past there. There's no real path around it. There's no real good access to the reservoir area. So this is a project that would be funded in two phases. The first round would be this nearly $1.5 million for this coming fiscal year. And the Recreation Department would uh, tackle this to do an extensive planning and design process with community input uh, in, in the current calendar year. And then for, finalize everything, go out to bid at the very end of the year and be ready to start construction in calendar year 2022. Uh, the, there is additional budget to this. This is actually estimated to be about a 2.3 to $2.4 million project. Um, and that's just because of the growing exponential expense of this kind of public works project, but also the extent of the need that there is. It includes uh, a well overdue need to replace the um, out of date lighting that will soon become unsafe. Um, and the electrical systems and a whole bunch of other things, amenities, site improvements that will make it a great park, not just for people playing athletics there, but for the community to enjoy and a better connection to the reservoir, as I mentioned, uh, for a more unified recreational experience. So the, the plan is to come back to the CPA committee or possibly to capital um, for the next fiscal year for about another $900,000 in funding to complete that. But we thought that was wise and I'm glad that Joe proposed, Joe Connolly proposed doing that because they're gonna go through a good design process this year and we'll have a much better idea of what the needs are uh, at the end of the year when, they, when, when the CPA committee is in its funding cycle. So we're happy to do that. Staying in recreation land, uh, we are also able this year uh, because of our budget situation to 
uh, to take on the Spy Pond playground renovation, which is also uh, very much overdue, as you can see by some of the pictures there. This is one of the more heavily, most heavily used playgrounds in Arlington and beloved, and it's well loved. And uh, the equipment is many years past its natural lifespan. And there we are now dealing with some potentially hazardous conditions. So uh, the need is clear and we're able to, glad to be able to do this. One thing that um, we were interested to hear Mr. Connolly present is that studies of the park have shown that the age groups using this park have shifted and it's now much younger. And these structures are not as appropriate for a much younger set. So when this design process is done in consultation with the community, uh, the, some of the structure will be more age appropriate and uh, just a great resource for the neighborhood and for the whole town. So now let's move on to the historic preservation uh, end of this. And, you know, in some ways I've often said that even though we spend less money in this area, it's one of, one of our favorite areas because this is an area where uh, almost no money would go to, this, to these really important needs for the cultural and historical identity of the town um, if we didn't have CPA. And I think particularly with the Jason Russell House because they have been engaged in a multi-year restoration effort funded by CPA and by matching grant funds that the CPA funds are making possible, we are going to save this house for another generation. And that is immensely gratifying. Uh, to all of us and I hope to you and to the to the town. Uh, and similarly, the Old Schwann Mill uh, nonprofit has been an excellent steward of some prior CPA funding. Uh, in this case, the, the Schwann Mill uh, is having used wisely CPA funding to replace and restore the windows and the main building is now wanting to do the same with 15 windows on the barn. And they also want to do a structural engineering report with the balance of the funds that would hire a structure engineer and just make sure that there aren't any surprises lurking uh, in, the main, in the main buildings of the mill, uh, which is a good in investment um, in, in this priceless historic uh, resources uh, future. With the Jason Russell House, uh, this $249,000 uh, recommended appropriation is for a very interesting purpose. Uh, the house, as you know, is only open part of the year because it is neither, it's not heated, not air conditioned either, but the reason it's not open in the winter is pretty obvious. It's an uninsulated historic house. And so the Historical Society uh, has done a lot of groundwork, a lot of research, and they believe, cons consulting with a number of experts, that an, a heat pump solution can be implemented here. And more interestingly, uh, very likely a geothermal source heat pump that could, because of the, the nature of the property, um, could go in there and because the rocks are a great thermal mass, it's, it can be over the long term and, and, and especially with the, the yearly operating costs, far less expensive to operate than an air source, air to air heat pump. So they, they're wanting to do that. What we have asked them to do is uh, with this proposed appropriation is to continue to do due diligence, to get an independent evaluation and energy evaluation to make sure that that is the right decision uh, for all considerations, not only for cost, but just for the building itself. Besides being able to open the building year round, which would be the goal uh, for this, which would be really exciting for the cultural programming uh, for Jason Russell. It would also allow the Historical Society to bring back some really important but fragile exhibits that are now in climate control storage and show them to us in the house, to the public because of a climate control system. This would also replace the existing oil fired climate uh, heating system in the caretaker's cottage. And frankly, the historical society and all of us would really sleep better knowing that there is not a oil fired combustible uh, heating system for any part of this, including the attached cottage. So that's what this would accomplish. And finally, in historic uh, preservation, this is something that was new to me uh, until Altosta came forward and, and said, you know, guess what? Right around this location, and I'll show you a little picture here, is a little sliver of a historic park. And it turns out that on the afternoon of April 19th, 1775, this famous day in our nation's history, uh, most, uh, the, the most casualties and some of the fiercest fighting happened right in this tiny, triangle of land. Now, it was a little bit bigger then. This was not the tiniest battlefield 
in the world, but it is perhaps the tiniest battlefield memorial in the area. Um, but there are some existing monuments and rocks there, but we're not doing anything with it. Nobody knows about it. And I think Al uh, recognized that this area of town is, uh, is the center of some economic development. There, there's the plans for a hotel going in, and there's other work that the uh, ATAD and other folks are doing to raise the awareness of what we call the Bloody Mile, going from Lexington all the way to the Jason Russell House for the battle that day. And there's a really interesting opportunity to make this much more of a of landing spot and an attraction protect, protects, uh, particularly in conjunction with some of the economic development. So this would uh, fund a study that would, uh, even though it's proposed by a citizen, would be overseen and administered by the town manager's office uh, in conjunction with other town departments, just to see what's possible, uh, to see what we could do to make this a cultural attraction and maybe boost some of the economic activity in this area. So uh, we plan to, to put that forward. I'll pause there uh, before I go to this budget page and see if there are any questions about the projects particularly from the board. All right, Mr. Diggins, any questions? Yeah, uh, questions and a couple comments. I mean, uh, so, um, uh, so <laughs> kind of jokingly, I'm just wondering like, how did they live in the Jason Russell house back in the day, because it certainly was cold back in the winter. So, so, uh, 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 so that's just a joking question. But uh, I look, I mean, I, I, I really, uh, what I really like about the Jason Russell house project is that you know, the heat pump element of it, because uh, with that and with all the other projects, I want to encourage you, know, you to uh, focus on sustainability. Uh, even if the cost is a little higher, I know the goal is to stretch the dollars as much as we can, as much as we can. But I think, I mean, as a community, we really do need to focus more on sustainability because if we're not around, I mean, the money that we spend on these projects will be for naught. Uh, and the last um, is on the foot of the hills. Um, I, I, I a little familiar with that area because I walk a lot in, and so uh, when looking into that, we. Uh, also focus on um, pedestrians because that can be a little tricky place to, <laughs> to cross uh, the street. And, uh, so so um, when we are going to maybe attract people towards it, we, then let's think about how they can we, um, be in that area safely as pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Dunn? Um, I am particularly happy to see the, I, I'm happy with the with the array of projects. I'm particularly happy to see support of the Somerville Homeless Coalition because I think they've been really good partners with the town and I'm glad that we can uh, find a way to help uh, support them as well. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan? Sorry. Oh, my computer's so slow. Um, uh, I wanna thank Mr. Helmuth and um, my colleague, Ms. Rowe, on behalf of the CPA. Um, for their presentation and saving our necks on several projects. Um, just, I think three, perhaps four comments um, to echo my, my colleague, Mr. Dunn's um, sentiments on the Somerville Homeless Coalition. I too also am very grateful that CPA will be able to um, cover this expenditure, but um, as myself and Mr. Hurd knows, um, we're on the CDBG subcommittee. Um, and I'm just, I guess through the town manager with the planning department or through the town manager, the some of the homeless, homeless coalition requested approximately the same amount and uh, was approved under the general fund 37,000. Now it appears on the CPA um, uh, 27,228 dollars. And there was a request through CDBG of 38,201, which it appears to me that's all one request. So just on behalf of CDBG for public services, um, when we received the quest, request from some of the homeless coalition, it was not noted to us that it already was approved by for 37,000 for the general fund and anticipated through the CPA at 27,228. Um, and we would have had to cut on CDBG on the public services approximately 20.2% services of $176,000 budget, 
which to all the different groups that are inherent in there, seniors, uh, Fidelity House, Boys and Girls Club, scholarship programs, um, that would have been a difficult decision. So if we could somehow um, highlight if an individual, I'm not, I'm not picking on some of the homeless coalition because I've certainly stood by that and especially during COVID uh, utilized their services um, uh, intensely uh, for outreach for people, but um, that there needs to be some sort of asterisk or something that if a particular request is going to CDBG, to CPA, and to general fund that all those three entities know of that and that can be reconciled so that um, a decision is made that doesn't need to have to be. Um, so I, I don't know, Adam, if I'm being clear on that. I can turn to Adam on that. I can just comment too, and because I did speak with Mike Libby the other day about the request that went through CBG. And my understanding, and Adam can expound on this for me, is that the request that went to CBG that was ultimately in the general fund was to fund efforts that the Summer Homeless Coalition for the outreach program over in the Mugar area. And it sounds like from Mr. Helmuth's presentation that this is a different program that's meant to supplement rental income for the 25 units that they have in Arlington. But Mr. Chapdelaine, do you have any I, I would simply just confirm that, Mr. Chairman, that there is no duplication between the CPA request and the program where there was duplication between the request and the general fund and the CDBG. This is a separate program, as you just described. Okay, so if we can kind of get a handle on that, I'm not saying they shouldn't request in duplicate or triplicate, triple areas, uh, but th that needs to be noted so that, you know, if, I, I just would have cringed at that we made those cuts to co cover um, HSC and it was already covered by the general fund. And then um, I, I guess a comment and question on um, the foot of the rocks allocation, which I am along with my colleagues 100% uh, behind, um, just to throw my comment in on that. Uh, one of the things um, regarding uh, tourism that Lexington's very good at, and that they always ask Arlington, you know, how, how are you so good with restaurants and uh, getting that economy going? Um, statues are a big thing. Um, I, and I understand my colleague, Mr. Diggins, comments around pedestrian safety, but um, if, if it's applicable, if we could get some sort of statue out there, I don't know if David Lansom. Um, I'm hearing something funny, sorry. If, David Lansom would be appropriate or not, um, but uh, in terms of having a hotel there and, and encouraging tourism, uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. And then my last question um, would be a, a future question. And I don't know if our, uh, if Mr. Helmuth or perhaps our colleague, Ms. Rowe, because I know she and I started on this in the beginning, um, regarding the recent national uh, federal scenic highway designation that Arlington along with three or four other um, adjacent communities have received uh, in light of that designation um, would it be a possibility that uh, moving forward with that that uh, CPA would play a role in either dovetailing on some uh, scenic byway federal requesting funding and or augment, augmenting that program, if that would be applicable to CPA? I don't know if Clarissa can answer that. Clarissa, please. Oh, thank you. Um, yes. Um, last week, we got notification that the uh, Department of Transportation and S Secretary Buttigieg had decided that we got a federal designation of an all-American road. And that means that the Battle Road Scenic Byway is now a federal program. And this Battle Road Scenic Byway is the towns of Arlington, Lexington, um, Concord and Lincoln and the Minuteman National Park. And what we will be able to do is leverage um, federal funds to do improvements in those four towns and at the Minuteman National Park. It's especially important right now because the um, we will be we will be celebrating the 250th 
um, birthday of the country. And there are a lot of things planned for the Minuteman um, National Park. And so we can start taking advantage of that. And the, um, the foot of the rocks, I think, is an excellent idea. And it's um, Mr. Tosti has the same ideas about sculpture um, as <clears throat> Mrs. Mahan does. Um, there also is for Mr. Diggins, that whole intersection is being looked at from a traffic point of view so that we will be capturing more land <coughs> in, in that area for people and not just for the statues. Um, that's a very dangerous intersection and for cars and for people. So that will be part of the $55,000 um, $55, um, <coughs> um, study. And I am the mother of a sculptor. So I don't think we want to ask for too many pieces of sculpture because bronze pieces of sculpture are very expensive. But um, I'm going to try to help Al. Um, and so is Joanne Robinson of the um, Historical Commission to fulfill his dream. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, move approval of the CTA committee's um, proposal. All right. And then Mr. DeCourcy, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Helmuth and Mr. Rowe for the um, great presentation. It's really an impressive uh, list of projects here. And um, just one question on, on Herd Field on behalf of the chairman. Is, is there uh, any new signage that's included in the project? Uh, <laughs> that was meant as a joke. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, I am curious on Herd Field. Is, is, do you know if that includes any work on Millbrook going around the the outer boundaries of it, if that was part of the application as well. No, look at it, look at it right now. Clarissa, do you remember it? Yeah, I do remember it. It is um, very much in the minds of the of Joe Conley and the Parks and Rec Commission um, because of the pathway and the bike trail have been impinging on the on the field, and a lot of people have been taking um, shortcuts because they're trying to get from the Millbrook and the and the bike path through the field, so they're reconfiguring the um, whole pathway. There's a circular system that will allow greater access to Millbrook and also to um, Drake Village. So it's it's really a um, you know the the proximity to the reservoir is a very important um, and one of the reasons that there is damage there is because of flooding in that area. Okay, thank you. And uh, just a comment and, and to my colleagues have already brought this up, but on the leasing differential program, and I'm glad that uh, you have found the funds for that, but an added benefit of that program too, which helps landlords in town is my understanding is that, that the homeless coalition almost works as a guarantor for the, um, for the individual rents. So not only are we helping people find apartments, but we're also providing security for the for the landlords that are renting. And I think that's an added benefit of uh, of these funds. So um, I have a couple of other questions related to the budget, but I'll hold off on that until after that part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I just, I should say for the record, I knew nothing about the renovation of Herdfield until Mr. Helmuth told me last week. But I am glad to see it's moving forward because for many years people have come to me that use the field and complained about the conditions of the field and I tried to explain to them I have no control over what actually happens at the field. Um, and then also the Spy Pond playground, which I think was put in when I was young and it felt new at the time, but I, I took my my boys there last year and it's, it's definitely a neat for some updates and I'm glad to see that moving forward. And, you know, when we have these CPA presentations, the bulk of the funds go towards such things as recreation, but it's always so interesting and gratifying to see the CPA funds that go towards historic preservation, which tend to be smaller amounts, but in a tight budget that we have year after year, it would always be hard to work those into a general fund budget. And so, you know, we're so grateful for the CPA 
for carving out that niche so we can do these these upgrades to the historic structures that we have in Arlington and serving as the board designee on ATED. For years, we've really been trying to come up with a plan to show how to spread the word and show individuals the great treasures that we have in Arlington. And you know, with the work of the CPA, we can help do that. And particularly the, the foot of the rocks, that's an area that we try to incorporate on our walking tour. And it's hard to get people to <laughs> go to the, the corner there just to see the rock. So I'm interested to see what, what updates we can do there and what the plan can come up with to, because there is certainly some really interesting history there. Ahead of, as Ms. Rowe said, we have the Battle Road 2025 committee that is a joint venture between some of the towns around that we're looking for a pretty significant um, celebration, which is when I first was involved in the committee, it seemed like it was a long way away, but I think as we get closer and closer, there's a lot of work that will need to be done to get to uh, show the history of Arlington for all the individuals that will be in the area at that time. So I'm really excited to, to, uh, to see what the result of the, the study will be. And thank you both for all your work in those areas. So with that, I'll have Mr. Helmuth continue on with this presentation to the budgetary, the budgetary portion of this. Thank you very much. I, I, do, I do just want to suggest to Mr. Diggins' uh, initial questions that I think they had a really big fireplace to get through the winter when, when Jason Russell was living there. Uh, so as you can see from the budget grid, uh, and many thanks to Julie Wayman for her usual excellent work with this. Um, I wanted to explain a little bit about, about housing. So in last year's annual town meeting, we actually, uh, we've traditionally, not, not by any set policy, but been funding at least a half million dollars a year to affordable housing. Um, and, and I think as, as you know, that just because of the, the cycle of affordable housing development, some of that we, had, we had, have not had as much in the last couple of years for requests. So last year, we, uh, town meeting with our recommendation reserved $500,000 to an affordable housing reserve fund that can only be used for more housing. And uh, so this year we had a little bit, as you can see in requests, totaling about 280,000. So what we're gonna do, uh, recommend that town meeting uh, take, so we have to spend 10% of the anticipated revenues on each, each CPA category. So that 10% of, of the projected revenues will be about 216 grand. So, we'll put that towards housing and then we'll draw just a little bit down from that half million um, that's still there. That'll leave about, you know, that'll leave 470 or so thousand dollars or more uh, available for, for future housing appropriation. Uh, the committee has not talked about the affordable housing trust, but that is an option for, uh, for some of that uh, resources or other affordable housing expenditures that, that could come up uh, in the future. I also point out um, that you, the two yellow high, highlighted uh, cells here show, you know, that our projected uh, expenditures for the budget plus the little bit of administrative expenses we do uh, comes to a little bit less than 2.7 million, and we would have a little slightly less than about 3 million left uh, available, rather for appropriation. That's a combination of incoming revenues and project and uh, a fund balance that that uh, will still be in the bank. So uh, that would if we funded everything that would still leave um, over $300,000 from this year. And the committee has not yet determined what we would do with that, whether we just leave that in the unrestricted fund balance or whether we would designate some of that for, uh, for any other um, pro program area. Uh, we do budget conservatively. We, we recommend that we leave some balance there in the case there are opportunities that come up mid-year for a special town meeting that we want to want to urgently deal with. Uh, but yeah, that's just a quick overview of the budget. I, I believe um, one member at least had a question on that. So I'll turn it back over to the chair. Uh, we'll go back in order, Mr. Diggins. Uh, I have no questions, thank you. And Mr. Dunn? No questions, thank you. And Mrs. Mahan? Sorry, well, my computer's thing. Um, in, in terms of the uh, approximate unrestricted, unrestricted funds of 
thousand. Is that separate or a part of the um, and program funds uh, under CPA um, or turn back? So the uh, the the turn so the three hundred thousand that would be uh, sur sort of surplus that that we wouldn't spend from what we could spend would be whatever is left over. So we think we think there's about three million dollars that we could appropriate, and that three million is comprised of anticipated revenues, you know, in, for next year, plus about six hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars in the fund balance that just hasn't been spent yet. That would include, and that includes. Um, uh, the five million dollar or five hundred thousand in housing that's set aside, um, and then about one hundred seventy in turnbacks. So, so that would really just sort of be a balance sheet. Uh, if town meeting appropriates this two point six eight four, um, then there'd be about three hundred thousand dollars that's not appropriated that would be available for future CPA appropriations. And um, again, I'm going back to CDBG when we. Um, Met as a subcommittee, there's close to 300,000 in unprogrammed funds. Um, and I asked the planning department to uh, look into, uh, instead of just carrying that over, uh, allocating that um, under the appropriate percentage categories that we can do under HUD. Um, I guess I would have the same question um, either for you or Ms. Rowe regarding CPA project turnbacks. Do you all have a policy for that? Or uh, do you have, if it gets to a certain point, there is a spend out, I don't want to say spend down, or uh, I'm just thinking of, you know, uh, possible override coming up, up in the future, mm -hmm. uh, looking at CDBG on program funds, and looking at CPA uh, turnback funds, uh, what CPA's policy is regarding that. Clarissa, do you want to address that? Sure. Um, one of the reasons that we have those turnbacks <clears throat> is because the people on the staff, including um, Jim Feeney and Julie Wegman, are very, very good. And Jim, especially, who is kind of our construction honcho, is he's always looking for ways to cut the budget to make sure that things are well spent. And um, the burial ground work. Some of that has been turned back. There are little bits from every project, but um, he develops a relationship with the grantees. And because of the trust between the, him and the grantees, um, he is um, finding that there is turn back. One of the things when we started this process, we weren't sure that we could fund all the projects that we had. And so we were looking for the turnbacks, um, as it turns out, the um, revenue from the state is much higher because there's been a lot of real estate action, as probably the chair of this board knows. And so that the, that came in higher, but we were scrambling around for funds because the initial requests were higher than the amount of money we had. So Jim went and found some money for us. That isn't, it's not usually that much, that much money. Yeah, we sent him. We sent him hunting for it yeah. uh, because of that. And um, yeah, and I think I would just reiterate what what Clarissa said that um, when the turnbacks happen, it's because of good management of the funds. Um, that sometimes happened with some of our nonprofit grantees. They really work hard to only use the money that they need. Since, since CPA funds are dispersed on a reimbursement basis, so these are actually we call them turnbacks, but they're actually funds that just haven't been drawn down because they, they found savings on the ground. So our policy, I think, answered to Ms. Mahan's entirely appropriate question is that those those are plugged back into the to the um, not for not for CPA committee operations but for future CPA projects um, and that is actually you know that's actually by state law as well okay so uh, and uh, my, my question and, and not that it was taken that way is it in no way critical just oh, yeah. again with uh, I think I uh, had this question at our last select board meeting or just put it out as a comment that um, when we're looking at uh, the possible number, which Mr. DeCourcy chairs the committee, the long range planning committee that yeah. Adam and, S and Sandy and others are looking at. Uh, uh, my thing is, I don't even want to say if, when we do go to the voters that we've looked at um, every possible nook and cranny um, and looking at the unprogrammed funds 
of about 300,000 uh, in possible turn back funds of 170. Um, there's half a million dollars right there. So uh, my question from uh, the last select board meeting, uh, and I, I don't know if, if Eric or um, Clarissa, uh, Mr. Helmuth or Ms. Rowe or Mr. Chaplain want to uh, comment on this, they don't have to, but my question or suggestion at the last meeting was that uh, are we, um, when we're coming up with what we're going to return to as a result of Mr. Fawcett's presentation, looking at CPA, looking at CDBG, if it can tick off half a million or whatever uh, going forward. So what, what I would say to Mr. Helmuth and Ms. Rowe is uh, if it's appropriate, definitely want uh, the CPA committee a partner in um, working towards uh, what ultimately gets presented, maybe not at the next meeting, maybe a meeting after of long range planning, uh, that we can demonstrate to the voters that we've looked under every rock and pebble mm -hmm. that we can um, to, to arrive at that number. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a question on the state match line, um, and I see that's estimated at 17.7%. And um, I think we're probably all concerned as to what what may happen with that in the future. I'm just wondering, you one, um, how do you feel about that estimate? And two, how does that compare to, let's say, the past few years in terms of what the percent match has been? Helmuth, Ms. Oh, oh, go ahead, Clarissa. I didn't see anything that. Well, you go ahead, Eric. Uh, I, I feel really good about this estimate because we think that the real estate match is, is going to be even higher. Uh, the DOR has not yet released its guidance for what, what to expect, so we're taking an extremely conservative uh, I believe this was what we, the state match was last year, but the, yeah. but the actual transactions have been, uh, we, we think this is, is probably going to be over 20. Um, yeah. um, so, you know, in, in, the, in that case, we'll even have, you know, additional funds to contemplate um, using or reserving. Um, I think though the trajectory is high and that's just because the legislature did pass um, a couple of years ago, a, a fix to increase the registry of these feeds yeah. that, that replenish the, um, the state fund uh, for this. And it's a good thing they did because uh, the match would have sunk. It was sinking down it, perilously close to single digits was where we were heading and is now heading back up. Mm -hmm. And it's because uh, they patched the revenue source from the state um, and they were heading, it was heading down because more and more towns adopted. It was a victim of its own success. So uh, now I think that with the real estate market continuing to thrive, uh, that has been helpful. And you know that won't always be the case but I think the fundamentals of the fund are in better shape than they were. Yeah. Uh, Clarissa, did you want to add? And I, I agree. I um, sit on the statewide coalition, so I have a pretty good handle on that. And one of the big problems this year had been um, <clears throat> the state, because of the pandemic, was having a hard time um, bringing their records up to date. So the first match that the Department of Revenue suggested was much lower. And that was because they'd only looked at six months of um, revenues. And so that's why the, the percentage is getting higher and higher. And I think we just have to, I think the most important thing is to listen to the real estate market. And um, it's booming in Massachusetts. And um, I think that that gives us some hope for the next couple of years, we'll see. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic where in great economic distress. So whether that will continue, I don't know, but it's counterintuitive to me. Great, thank, thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I don't think there was a second of uh, Ms. Mahan's, uh, Mrs. Mahan's motion. So I'd like to um, offer a second uh, on that. Thank you. Yep. And my only question was the same as Mr. Corsi's about the state match. And I know you mentioned the 17% was based on last year's if you recall, where is that in relation to, say, the year before that and the year before that? Is there a trend where each year it seems to be a little higher than the next? Yes, it has been going up. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at my the chart, but um, but it, but it is it is increasing, and I think I think we think it'll be over twenty. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that's happening as more and more towns come into the CPA. I think we have now 370 
between 371 and 378 communities. There is always the worry that the, um, with more and more communities, the money would get smaller. But what happens is there becomes with more and more communities getting into the program, there is more political will to make sure that the money in the fund um, continues to thrive. And that we, uh, about two or three years ago, we got the deeds tax um, raised and you know some things that really helped the program. The program has been a tremendous success and it's, um, you know, it, I get great satisfaction um, to see all the work that's being done in Arlington because of it. It's small money, but it's it's certainly important in the, you know, the, the, the human way of living in a community. And I mean, I can certainly attest that if it's based on funding from the registry deeds that there's gonna be plenty of funds available in past years, if you looked at the queue, when we submit documents to be recorded, there might be 10 to 15 documents. Now there's about 500. So there's plenty of registry of deeds fees that should be coming in. We'll look forward to more great projects based on that. Um, all right, so we have a motion to, was it a motion to receive or a motion to approve, Ms. Mon? No, uh, approve. Proof and second by Mr. DeCorsi, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Maha. Yeah. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank and thank you both. All right. At long last, that takes us to our consent agenda. We have item number five, minutes of meetings, January 25th, 2021, January 25th, 2021, emergency addendum. We have a request for a contractor drain layer license for Callenback Enterprises, Chris Callenback, 135 Bass Point Road, Nahant, Massachusetts, 01908. And we have a reappointment to the Arlington Tree Committee for Steve Moore, term to expire 12-31-2023. So I will separate the meeting minutes vote just as I- Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. None will abstain. So on the item number five, minutes of meetings, Mr. DeCorsi, do we have a motion? Yes, I move approval. And Mr. Diggins, do we have a second? Yes, you do, second. Any comments, Mrs. Mahan? No, thank you. All right, Attorney Hyde? Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. DeCorsi? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. All right. And do, do we need Mr. Dunn to abstain? I abstain. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Yep. All right, and then we'll take a motion for item number six and item number seven on the consent agenda. Mr. Diggins? I move to six. Approve this consent agenda. All right, and second, Mr. Dunn? Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. All right, and that takes us to a public hearing. We have an Eversource petition for Everett Street. We have Jacqueline Duffy, supervisor, for of rights and permits for Eversource. All abutters notified. Do we have Ms. Duffy with us? And Ms. Duffy, can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. How are you? Um, I'm Jacqueline Duffy. I'm the right-of-way agent out of the Somerville Service Center. The Eversource uh, Energy respectfully requests a granted location for the installation of a hip guy on Everett Street. The work is necessary to support the existing pole line on Everett Street. All right, and with that, I will turn to the board. Mr. DeCorsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll move approval subject to the additional conditions contained in the uh, engineering division memorandum. I also wanna add a, 
a further condition beyond that, um, that if the work requires the installation of a second pole, that the first pole will be removed or the original pole will be removed within 90 days pursuant to chapter 164, section 34B. And the reason I bring that up is um, the last time Eversource was before us for a hip guy, um, we approved it and it was on Mass Ave and the hip guy turned into a double pole that more than a year later is still a double pole. So uh, I think it's appropriate in this circumstance if it becomes necessary. It doesn't sound like it will be, but if it does, we really don't want a double pole at that site. Can I ask if the double pole on Mass Ave is still there? Yes, it is. Okay, well, I'll look into that tomorrow. Mrs. Mahan. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I, I would, oh, oh, I, I, I am un unmuted. I'll, I'll definitely second that. And um, and I'm very encouraged by um, Jackie, Ms. Duffy, but uh, Ladybug Jack, then she's going to look into that and she definitely will follow through because she's been very um, uh, professional and responsive to Arlington. So um, thank you, Ms. Duffy, for doing that. And thank you, Mr. DeCorsi, for pointing that out. So I, I will second. Mr. Diggins? I support what Mrs. DeCourcy, I'm sorry. I support what Mr. DeCourcy said, you know, and, and I have no further comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, I don't think I heard a second and uh, I'll be happy to second it. Or maybe Mrs. Mahan did and I missed uh, it, I apologize. Yep, Mrs. Mahan seconded it, yep. All right, and I have no further comments. This is a public hearing. If any members of the public would like to speak on this matter, please use the raise hand function in your Zoom application now. I do not see any hands. Oh, we have one. Did you promote Ms. Maloth check? Yeah, yes, her hands up. I, I can do that right now. Ms. Malachik, can you hear us? Can you hear me? We can, if you can just say your name for the record. Beth Malachik, Russell Street, town meeting member, precinct nine. Is this about the polls? It was hard to follow. The Eversource polls, that's what my comment is regarding. Steve DeCourcy mentioned the double poll still existing on Mass Ave. I just wanted to point out that there are double poles all over town. I have one in front of the house I live in. Um, they took out the rotten lower four feet of an existing pole um, and then lowered it to the ground. So now the wires connecting to the house are at a dangerously low level. I'm assuming it's not at a regulatory level. Um, so that pole needs to be attended to, as I think, do all of the double poles all over town. And Mr. DeCourcy, the pole that you mentioned on Mass Ave, is that the one that looks shattered on the north side of Mass Ave, um, up towards East Arlington? There was a pretty extravagant, in the sense of appalling, shattered pole towards East Arlington on the north side of Mass Ave. Mr. If I could, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Yeah, no, that's, you're absolutely right. It's not that shattered pole, which is, I think, at the end of Foster Street. This is a little further down by the gas station um, before we, you get to Bates Road. That's where the, the, the last hip guy was put in. We had this discussion before when Verizon was in, because I believe Verizon has the primary responsibility to maintain poles in Arlington. And so um, I hear you and your concerns, and, and we're going to... Um, continue to try to address that. But this this was a particular poll on Everett Street. And that, that's why I put that additional condition in. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and I'll follow up with Steve DeCourcy <laughs> since he seems to be the one on top of this particular issue. But um, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question to Beth. What What is your address, Beth? And I can look into that one also. 
It's 20 Russell Street. And my additional concern is a week or so prior to our poll becoming airborne, I mean, the bottom just rotted out on its own. The neighbor across the street had to call the fire department who called the whichever electric company to come and deal with it. So a week or so immediately prior, one of your contractors came and injected tons of, uh, I don't know what you inject, but nasty smelling chemicals, kind of smells like kerosene, which is then leaking into the ground. We're on a slope. It's all ending up in Mill Brook. I mean, this is ridiculous. We have a higher level of environmental consciousness and um, we all know the polls are unsightly. Um, it would, we'd greatly appreciate it if they could be addressed. I mean, you know, uh, I'm concerned Lutton, about mine, but I'm concerned about everyone's. If you can, you can put their concerns in an email to us and we'll, we'll forward it along to and start on the particular poll. Thank you, you Chairman Hurd, I appreciate questions. that. Yep. And Mr. DeCourcy, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Stuffy. You're welcome. All right. And seeing no further hands raised, we have a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, second by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Hyde? Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Yeah. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Sam is hope. Thank you, Ms. Duffy. Thank you. Stay positive. Test negative. All right. That takes us to appointments. Item number nine on our agenda. We have an appointment to the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Melissa Tino Collis, term to expire. January 31st, 2023, and we have an appointment to the Election Modernization Committee, Giovanna De Stephanus. Um, do we have these two individuals with us, Mr. Chaplin? All right, and Ms. Tinnacalis, I apologize if I said your name incorrectly there. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on the redevelopment board. Hey, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, my name is Melissa Tintopoulos, and I live in Arlington. I've lived in Arlington for 12 years, and my background is urban planning. So I studied urban planning um, at the University of Michigan, I'm originally from California, but I've worked in Somerville, Lexington, and now I'm working in Burlington with a focus on economic development. And um, I just saw, you know, the redevelopment board and the opening um, as an opportunity to kind of share my expertise and kind of contribute to the community I live. Thank you. I will open up to the board. Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you very much for volunteering. Uh, volunteers <laughs> are, uh, as you know, when you're with your work in the other town in Lexington and, and uh, Burlington, that uh, volunteers make it all work. So thank you. And Mr. Diggins. I'd like to um, move approval of her appointment. And, uh, and also um, uh, say I'm really, really thrilled uh, to have you on board, Ada. Uh, and and your, um, your, your CV, your resume is very impressive. Uh, it's good to have someone with a planning background in all the communities that you've worked. I mean, as a part of the um, the redevelopment board, and, and uh, I would love to ask some kind of like get to know you questions, but I'll save those for later and hopefully meet in person um, and, and, and discuss. Uh, so thank you so much. Welcome aboard. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Mahan. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Pintocalis. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, <laughs> Melissa. Um, I'm very impressed with your background especially economic, economic planning. Um, this, you're a captive, captured audience, so I'm gonna take advantage of the fact. That, um, two things I'd put before you, um, uh, first and second, but especially the first and actually second too, uh, in light of your experience that you have uh, in terms of Arlington just began um, a study and hired a consultant uh, for our one, industrial zone which is up by gold's gym um uh, i just want to highlight that to you in light of your experience 
um, with Lexington and Burlington, and even before that in I think California, but or some of them. I'm, I'm perhaps not mentioning that. That's been. I got on the board in 1999, and that was something that I thought was a, a vastly, if not overlooked, uh, underplanned, underutilized area. Uh, mm -hmm. Whatever you can bring to the process as a member of uh, the planning board, and then I also noted that um, you uh, were sort of sort of took the initiative on parklets um, yeah. before the pandemic, <laughs> which is uh, uh, good uh, hindsight on your part. Uh, but one of the things that I've heard from uh, a lot of our small businesses um, and mid-sized businesses here in Arlington is. Um, that that was a, a, a solution uh, because of need, um, but are, are there other solutions to make that constant, to make that better, to expand, and or other ways to think outside of the box? Um, because you know, if you said parklet here in Arlington a uh, year, three years before the pandemic, um, a lot of people would be like, you know, that's a waste of time. You're going to lose some parking spaces. And I, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome them. If you don't, I, I, that's okay too. Um, I, I mean, briefly speaking, I mean, I, I, part of why I'm here, you know, I've been part of the master plan and, you know, the master plan is a good blueprint, but if it doesn't translate into zoning, you won't really reach any of the goals outlined there. So that's one thing. And if we focus, you know, my approach has been focusing on, on places for people and, you know, what that means and not trying to drive it too much by car or things like that. So placemaking um, is part of that, you know, creating these, I would say, um, public assembly spaces that uh, allow for the civic engagement that are not entirely private. You know, that public realm is critical to, you know, the quality and value of development over time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, yeah, thank you, Ms. Tentacolas, for your willingness to serve. I imagine with your job in Burlington, there's a lot of nights that you're called on to do work. So the fact that you're volunteering to take on uh, more here in Arlington is really <laughs> impressive, and, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Corsi, I don't know if I got a second yet on that. Uh, second. And again, just to reiterate the board's comments, thank you for your willingness to serve on this is, you know, a board that we rely a lot on if, as far as the time commitment and, you know, your bill, your willingness to serve really says wonders about your commitment to the town. So I appreciate it. All right, we have a motion to approve by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. DeCorsi, Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank very much. Okay. All See right. Guys. And, Thanks, Adam. See you. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs> All right. And do we have Ms. DeStefanis with us? Yeah, and I, I believe Jim O'Connor was raising his hand as well. Would you like me to? Yep. All right, here they come. Mr. O'Connor, are you with us? Can you hear us? I am with you. All right, if you want to introduce Mr. Stephanus. Yes, uh, the Election Modernization Committee interviewed three candidates. We found Giovanna Di Stefanis to be excelling in both um, motivation and leadership skills, having been actively involved at the high school as a junior in working on education and social media and election reform. In fact, is pre-registered to vote. And of all the candidates, we enthusiastically recommend her appointment to the committee. Thank you. And Ms. DeSafanis, I apologize, I'm having trouble with the last names today. If you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you wanted to be, get involved with the committee. 
Yes, of course. Thank you so much for that introduction. That was so nice. Um, my name is Giovanna De Stefanis, and I'm a junior here at Arlington High School. And I would love to be on the election modernization committee um, in preparation for the general election and the Georgia runoff election. I phone banked through various organizations and while working with the Center for Common Ground, um, it was just really cool to provide residents with voting information and registering them to vote and um, providing them with transportation if they needed it. And, you know, it was something that was small, but I know that it did bring um, our country closer to a just democracy, which is extremely important. And because voting is such a powerful tool, I mean, I'm only 17, so I can't vote yet. Um, but I know that it is only fair if everyone is able to participate in it. And younger people statistically um, do not vote as much for various reasons, but I'm hoping that um, on the committee I can help modernize it um, to make it more accessible to younger people and have our elected officials reflect everyone. Um, and currently I'm on the local election committee of the Young Progressive Club. And I joined it because I didn't know anything about local politics at all. And Joe Caro came in and we interviewed him and I asked, you know, how can the club get involved in local politics? And he said, I mean, he said many different ways, but one of them that stood out was just to join a committee. And then this was an opportunity. And I think that um, it would be a really great way to get involved and educate myself. Um, and I really think that I could do that while being on the committee. Thank you. All right, I'll turn to the board for any question, comments, or motions. Mr. Diggins. Hey, I will happily make a motion to approve um, our appointment. And, and, and I'll be, you know, one of the best parts about this gig is reading CVs, and, and, and you already have an impressive CV. I can only imagine what it will be like in, in 10 uh, 20 years from now and and it's great that you're getting involved in local um elections read and what i really hope too is that the the, the youths as they say you know can also get their parents you know involved in local elections because because we really need more um, um, um voting in local elections and people more engaged in in in, in their community because it's really where the rubber hits the road so thank you very much for um being a part of the amc Mrs. Bond? I will definitely second Mr. Uh, Diggins' motion um, and to uh, Mr. DeStefanis. De um, I'm envious of your uh, opportunity that you availed yourself of to go down to Georgia and uh, uh, work on the vote down there. Um, I, I watched it from afar, so I'm, I'm really uh, admiring you for going down and being on the front lines. I don't know if you got to meet Stacey Abrams or Senator Warnock or Ostriff, but even if you didn't, you played a really important role uh, in that happening. And I'm even more uh, excited about the fact that um, two of my three children uh, who went through public schools, uh, I really tried to get them beyond minimal activists, meaning they voted for me and, and voted in other races. Um, and I just was not successful. So if I could adopt you as my third daughter, I would do that. Um, but I, I do want to say to you, um, I, I do admire you as a young woman, um, class of 2022, goes by Pondas, um, for uh, taking this on. And you can do far much more than um, any of us, any of my colleagues on the board, um, in influencing the vote uh, at the high school, the years that I uh, coached there, uh, talking to the young men and women who were moving forward and representing. Um, I had a voice, but it was a small voice. You have a very loud voice. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful that um, I'm on top of everything else that you're doing in courses in Harvard and things like that before you even get out of high school, um, you know, uh, God bless you. And if myself or any of my colleagues can uh, help you in any way in the future, you do have the election monetization committee that's a great resource that you'll contribute to and will be a resource to you. But please know we're all available to you. And uh, um, I just read uh, your resume, curriculum vitae, and, and heard your presentation tonight. 
but I'm so proud of you. So I just wanted to relay that to you with my definite sincere thanks. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That's so sweet of you. Hey, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, I'm happy to support your appointment. I'm also, uh, I actually was appointed my first committee when I was 17 before I could vote too. It was the, a library rebuilding committee. And there were some people who were really unhappy because they're like, he can't, he doesn't pay taxes. Why is he serving on this committee? And I said, well, you know, I use the library. And so that was, a, I think it's a, a great, uh, it's a great way of look out. You'll, you might get appointed to be select board for your second time. Uh, sometime in the in in the future, uh, you've got a great committee to be appointed to. There are some serious luminaries on that committee. Uh, when we when we put that committee together and we saw the nominees that got appointed to it, holy cow! You're with um, some world class, uh, literally world class participants, um, and I think you're a great addition. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you, Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and I want to echo the comments of my colleagues. Um, I'm so impressed by, by what you've done in a short period of time. Uh, congratulations for the work that you did in Georgia, the important work that you did in Georgia. We're seeing how crucial that the outcome of that is right, right now. And also, I want to congratulate you for uh, your induction into the National Honor Society um, and uh, wish you the best of luck as you continue on at Arlington High and, and also uh, with your work on the committee. So thank you so much for applying and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. I just want to reiterate what the board members said. Thank you for your, I'm sure your time is tight with everything you have going on, but your willingness to serve certainly says wonders about your, your personality and your commitment to the process. When I was in high school, my father served on this board and I had to be dragged out to participate in the election process. So the fact that you come out so willingly willingly to participate is really amazing. All right, so with that, we have a motion to approve by Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, yeah, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Janice vote. Thank you, Ms. Stefanis. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and that takes us to licenses and permits for approval. Food vendor license, Dell's Lemonade, 1050 Massachusetts Avenue. Paul Piatelli. Do we have Mr. Piatelli with us? There was two Paul, Paul Piatelli, so I promoted both of them. We'll we'll see who we we'll see who we get. Hello. Hi, Mr. Piatelli. Hi. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. If you could just tell us a little bit about your business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my sorry, my my father's on the line as well. So there's two of us. I'm Paul Jr. Um, Hello. Oh, here I am. Here we are. Here we are. How can we get my screen up? Um, oh, maybe I start video. Sorry. Hi. Uh, so yeah, I'm Paul Piatelli. Uh, my parents, Paul and Kathy Piatelli. Um, together we are Pap Inc. Dell's Lemonade. Um, Dell's Lemonade, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a all natural soft frozen lemonade. Um, my parents and I have been um, in the organization since 2003. Uh, we have a storefront in North Admiral, Massachusetts. Over the years, we've been bringing it to the Boston area. And for many of these years, we've been looking for a place to uh, find a place to um, a storefront to, to bring our lemonade. Um, we found Arlington and we love it. We found this space on 1050 Mass Ave. Um, and yeah, so I don't know if dad, mom, you want to say anything else about the business? Uh, we're looking forward to coming to Arlington. Um, I grew up in Brookline and we used to play sports against Arlington, a big rivalry. So I know the town very well. Um, great hockey players in Arlington. Um, so we're also in uh, Fenway Park and we're working with the Worcester Red Sox now to get in there. We do a lot of charitable events, donations, fundraisers, help the community, the youth. Uh, we want to hire local kids to work at the store. Um, I think we'll be 
a good asset for the town um, to bring a, a nice refreshing drink in the warm weather. And we'll have a nice ice cream too. If you want a nice ice cream, we'll have a sundae or ice cream cone. And uh, we're looking forward to doing business here. Appreciate it. And Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I want to move approval and uh, just let you know that I've been a longtime customer when I had the opportunity to buy it and really excited about having Dells in Arlington. So uh, thank you for choosing Arlington and best of luck. Thank you. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I be first, I can, I, I was late coming to Dell. I only found you when uh, you showed up at Fenway Park. Uh, and I definitely did enjoy it there. And uh, exactly as Steve said, thank you for choosing Arlington. And uh, I really appreciate you coming to town. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yes, I will um, move acceptance of the um, license request. I mean, and um, I haven't been yet. I look forward to it. You know, so um, thank you for um, um, coming to Arlington. And I walk past that area a lot. And so I'll stop in. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I, I want to say to uh, all the Piatelli family, uh, welcome to Arlington. Our town manager said he grew up on Dells in Fall River. Um, so you have a testament coming out from our uh, town manager. And uh, that, that's pretty good for me. And uh, your location is literally down the street from where I am. So uh, I'm really excited to uh, welcome you to Arlington and I really commend you in uh, the current pandemic for uh, not only taking the chance on expanding your business, but doing it here in Arlington, which uh, I'm confident, um, especially close proximity to our middle school and me, um, you will be successful. And uh, the only other thing I would uh, put out as just an opportunity, not a requirement, um, the planning department here in Arlington, especially during the pandemic for small businesses, it's a great resource, um, even just for information, but uh, please avail yourselves of that uh, opportunity, uh, as well as our Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they're, they're working with small businesses. You do not have to join. What they're doing is, if you're not a member, you can get their services and you don't have to uh, pay the dues. And if you, if you, you are a member, which right now you're not, but I'm letting right. other people know. If you are a member, they're waiving their fees because um, Arlington's really vested in um, doing everything that we can uh, through the town and through our uh, civic and business organizations to really try to do everything we can for small businesses. And um, I, I really commend your courageousness for um, expanding a small business in, in this pandemic. Um, but you uh, certainly have a lot of testaments from some of my current colleagues and Mr. Diggins and I seem to be the only two that haven't been uh, uh, indoctrinated into Dells, uh, but we will be soon. Thank you very much. Yes, you Thanks, will. Mr. Chair. Thank you for that advice. And again, yep. And thank you for choosing Arlington. Um, I haven't had Dells, I don't think yet, but I did just get a text from my wife upstairs that says, OMG, love Dells. <laughs> so you do have one client right there in the family. Um, but no, in all seriousness, I do appreciate you, you choosing Arlington during this time. And, you know, we certainly look forward to it. Um, so I have a motion by Mr. Diggins. Did we get a second? Yeah, I, I, I made the initial motion. Mr. Uh, Mr. Right. Mr. Corsi. Mr. Corsi made the motion. And Mr. Dunn, did you second the motion? I'd be happy to second it. All right. So we have a motion by Mr. Corsi, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Heim? Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes, sorry about that, Mrs. DeCourcy. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Thank you. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you all soon. <laughs> and that takes us to traffic rules and order and other business. We have for approval board designee appointment to the election modernization committee to replace Mr. Currow. Do we have any nominations or interest in serving on the election modernization committee? Mr. Diggins, had you been serving on that? 
Well, no, I haven't been serving on it, but I, I've been I've been attending as much as I could, you know. So I'm pretty familiar with what's going on there, you know. Uh, and, and so if um, no one else wants to be. I will be happy to do so, but if anyone else wants to, it, uh, it, I'm content not to, uh, and, and we'll just hang out as I have been hanging out. So we'll call that a statement of interest. <laughs> I'd like Corsi. to nominate uh, Mr. Diggins. All right, and Mr. Corsi? Second. All right, and so we have a motion to nominate Mr. Diggins, seconded by Mr. Corsi, attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right, that takes us to item number 13 on our agenda, housing authority appointment process. Attorney Heim. I'm gonna try to be really brief given the uh, uh, amount of items on the agenda tonight. I just wanted to put this item on the agenda, mostly for the public benefit, but also for the boards. Um, the board may be aware that there was a reform uh, bill to the appointment of a, of a, a tenant representative on the housing authority that was passed um, uh, and signed by the governor earlier this year. That bill has a little bit of quirky timing, but the long and short of it is, is that the board will now appoint a tenant uh, going forward um, from a local tenant organization of the housing authority. Um, there's a few uh, complications. Uh, some of our, I, I believe that there are several housing authority um, tenant organizations. There may be one um, or two uh, housing authority uh, complexes that don't have active tenant organizations, but because there are uh, at least some tenant organizations, you uh, basically will be soliciting folks to apply to be the tenant representative and then you'll be appointing them. Um, and then that uh, seat uh, under normal circumstances would be valid for five years, just like an elected housing authority term. Because uh, you've got somebody who's in there basically as an interim housing authority member and that seat was uh, still has a year left. Uh, the basic upshot is that if uh, when the time comes, uh, you can uh, reappoint or appoint someone new for an interim period of time uh, until the uh, tenant um, seat is eligible for appointment. By some quirks of the law, the law doesn't technically go into effect until May. So there will be a very brief period of time on which uh, your interim seat will have expired for the year, uh, but your uh, ability to appoint a tenant won't have yet matured. Uh, my recommendation is basically just to solicit um, an appointment of a tenant seat in much the same way that you did last time, but following the uh, new guidelines, which basically means that the housing authority helps to uh, promote the fact that the board is going to appoint a tenant seat. And I, you, the board doesn't need to take any action tonight. I just wanted to advise you that that's basically uh, what is now the board's responsibility. It's just going to be the board. It's not going to be the board and the housing authority. Because of the timing, it's a little bit odd. That seat will expire uh, basically uh, when the town, uh, uh, the, the day of the town election. And you can either um, choose to essentially appoint somebody with the intention to appoint them for the full remainder of the term, or you can appoint someone for the interim and um, have the appointment process again in May. Uh, my, I guess, feeling is that if the board appoints somebody with the intention of appointing them for the full term. I think that that's acceptable under the law. And there may be a formality that needs to be observed uh, when the law officially takes effect in May, but you'll be able to have some continuity there. So again, the, the basics of this, that the board uh, essentially uh, has now the authority to appoint a tenant member of the housing authority um, because of the way that the terms are staggered, that term will be for one year um, and then the next time it will be for five years. The board already appointed an interim housing authority member. Um, that seat expires at the town election. Uh, I think at that point in time, uh, you can probably just fill the seat and notice that it's your intention to fill that seat for both the uh, sort of lag period and the year that follows. I know that's a little bit convoluted. Um, you can see from the, uh, 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 
reference material here. It makes your eyes glaze over looking at the flow charts. Uh, but I think the, 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 the spirit of it is, 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 is fairly straightforward. Um, the board doesn't need to take any action. I just wanted to advise the board of this. I think it's important so that folks know that um, there's, that there's a seat coming up that the board will definitely appoint for the year remaining on that term. And then we'll be from here on out appointing for five years. All right, and I'll just see if anyone from the board has any questions on the process. Mr. Corsi? I have no question. Mr. Dunn? No questions. Mrs. Mahan? Um, I just wanna make sure I took in what you said that um, coming this May, the appropriate number of days before May, we need to notice and encourage people to apply to fill the year. And then the following year, we notice legally under the whatever it is, 30, 60 days for people to apply for a five year seat for the tenant. You said it better than me, Mrs. Mon. That's correct. Okay. So I, I would uh, leave it to the chair and uh, town council to work with the select board office. Uh, working backwards from May of this year to solicit applicants through the process and then uh, the future chair after April for, I guess, the May meeting um, to have that as an agenda item. So uh, thank you. I'm all set. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And any questions, Ms. Diggins? How could I possibly have any questions now? I'm all set. <laughs> all right. And with that... We will close that item. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, Mr. Uh, Chair, is it, is there yep. any way I could get like a three or five minute break before we go into Warren articles? Yep, so that's what I was gonna ask. All right, so oh. it's, nine, it's just about 9.30 now. We do have a number of Warren article hearings. So we're just looking to the board to see if we'd like to take a quick break. And it looks like we do. So we'll break for about five minutes, which will Bring, we'll call it seven minutes. We'll bring it back at 9.35. All right. It is now time for Warren Article Hearings. Item number 14, Articles for Review. We have Article 12, 13, 85, 86, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 87, 88, 89, 90, and 91. So in order to... Streamline this process with all the articles that we have. What we're going to do is we have a few articles that have the same proponent. We're going to bring up the proponent, allow them to introduce all the articles that they have before us within their own, they each have their individual time periods for that. Then we'll open up to the boards for any questions, comments, motions in regards to the individual articles. And then we will open up for public comment for that block of articles as well, just so we're not bringing people up and down that have multiple articles before us today. So the first article that we have is Article 12, a bylaw amendment changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. And that is inserted by the select board at the request of the Human Rights Commission. So as we bring them up, we will ask them to present on Article 12, Article 13, Article 85, and Article 86. And we have Mr. Pusey with us. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you, um, everyone. My name is Drake Pusey. I am a co-chair this year of the Human Rights Commission, uh, and I'm from Precinct 13. Um, First of all, I wanted to thank Attorney Heim for his very detailed um, explainers for these, the background and guidance uh, provided. And I also submitted some short introductions for these. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read them or really even um, extensively reference them. Um, but I'll explain the, the four articles. Um, Article 12 is the bylaw amendment. Uh, that one is um, to complete the changeover from Columbus Day to um, Indigenous Peoples Day. We wanted to make that change in the list of holidays. Um, for the completeness of the changeover, we would prefer if um, Indigenous Peoples Day was explained by the date, second Monday in October. Um, but I understand 
um, Attorney Himes um, referencing of the state and federal uh, legal holidays um, to explain it as well. Um, and this is, um, as you may have mentioned, an extension of the proclamation that you passed on uh, January 25th. Um, should I just go on to the next one or? Okay, um, Article 13 uh, is to insert Juneteenth Independence Day into that same list of holidays. Um, it was passed by the state. Um, we were reading the explainer from SHRM, the Society for Human Rights Management, and they explained that it is at the same tier of holidays, the partially restricted holidays as New Year's Day, Memorial Day, Independence Day, and Labor Day in terms of um, time off and overtime and all that stuff. I know the town hasn't really decided how it's going to do that from an HR perspective, but we took it upon ourselves to, to make the article, to make that change. Um, article 85 is a resolution um, asking the town meeting to um, endorse the same land acknowledgement that you endorsed in the proclamation. It is an encouragement, not a mandate. Um, like Attorney Heim explained, every co-chair in a public meeting will um, have their discretion, but it's a town encouragement. Um, there is a, sorry if this is scope creep, but an informal request um, along with this, if a member of the select board would be willing to read the land acknowledgement during announcements at the first night of town meeting, we would love that. We can talk about that later. Um, if no one wants to do it, it'll probably fall to someone on the Human Rights Commission. Um, and the last article is um, the resolution celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, and this is to give town meeting an opportunity to endorse the same celebration that you endorsed in the proclamation. That's the shortest version. If you have any questions, let me know. All right, and thank you. And we'll turn to the board for any questions, comments. Mrs. Mahan. Um, uh, if it's appropriate, I'd like to move approval. Can we do all of them together, uh, Attorney Heim or Attorney Cunningham, or should we do them separately? So we're gonna vote them separately um, just for the sake of, in case any okay. um, members want to vote separately on the individual articles. Mr. Chair, may I? Okay. Say um, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I, if Mrs. Mahan or any other board member would like to talk about each one of them in turn, I think that they can. It's just the votes that would need to be separate. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess on Article 12, I'd make a motion and then have a comment. I'd like to move approval um, on Article 12 and um, I'd like to thank the Human Rights Commission um, and others uh, on town staff that have uh, worked with us first in the proclamation stage of it. And now moving forward, I just wanna say one of my children wanted to be a teacher uh, at their very core. And one of the reasons why uh, uh, they didn't continue on with that endeavor, a lot of it had to do with Columbus Day and having to be a teacher and teach Columbus Day as it, it and, and Christopher Columbus as uh, traditionally has been taught in the past. But, um, my child went into library services instead. <laughs> um, so that, that's something that's very important to me um, through my child who educated me uh, in terms of, I knew a, a little bit of the past history, but I didn't know the import or importance of it um, until um, they went to college and uh, really had a conflict on, you know, wanting to be a teacher and not just around Christopher Columbus, but a, a couple of other uh, naturally accepted academic teachings um, that really went against their core uh, in terms of what they believe. So um, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of this and uh, we'll take up the other articles that I'm in favor with in due course. So uh, um, thank you to Ms. Pusey and everyone on Human Rights Commission and, and town staff. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And you can, if, you, if you'd like, Ms. Mahan, move and Attorney Jaime, correct me, you can move approval of all the articles that are sitting before us and we can catch a second for those as well. We just need to vote them at the end separately. Okay, if I could move approval of articles 12, 13, 85, and 86. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's correct, Attorney Jaime. 
That's fine. It's really just the, um, uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it's really just the, the end vote that should be parsed out. Yep. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Y'all yeah, second uh, Mrs. Mahan's motion. Um, and thank you, Mr. Pusey, for uh, bringing this forward. It, just one quick comment on Article 12, and I appreciate Attorney Heim and Attorney Cunningham's comments about um, potentially, um, or not potentially, that it, if the proposed bylaw change is adopted, it wouldn't conflict with state law. And I think this goes to the discussion that we had when we talked about the resolution. There still is a statute that is referenced, Chapter 6, Section 12B, that um, as long as that's on the books, there will be a state holiday known as Columbus Day. And, and that's the reason for the reference um, at the end, at least for state law purposes. So um, I know you had talked to um, the individuals who were on the, the night that the resolution came before us that there there has been a new bill filed in the, in the latest session. We'll see what happens with that. And um, if it is changed, we'll make a further change to the bylaw. Um, just a question on Article 85. On the land acknowledgement, and, and this may be later for Attorney Heim, we had a slightly different, um, we made some revisions to the uh, land acknowledgement in terms of um, uh, the language that was slightly different than, than what the Human Rights Commission had proposed. So I would just ask Attorney Heim to, uh, when that comes back to us, just to take a look at, at that original resolution and if there are any inconsistencies or just, just to correct that. All right. Yes, sir. And yeah, Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm definitely curious about. Uh, I, I have some. I have some stress about uh, holiday creep, but at the same time, uh, I understand why we're making this choice, um, and uh, I can I support it. But I, I definitely am. Um, I've, I worry a little bit about the about how long the list gets and, and, and how it does it. Now, of course, I come from an industry where the normal thing is, is you, like we have a really short list of holidays. We let people take holiday time off whenever they want. We don't actually have like a counted number of holidays. So I come from, definitely from a different place on this particular one. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm probably spending too much time to just say yes. Thank you. And Mr. Diggins? Um, yeah, I, I understand the efficiency of combining things, I mean, um, but but um, my brain's beginning to fry a little bit. I mean, so I'm just going to ask for some help, I mean, to um, just list out the ones and and I will give my comments or questions. I mean, so first is 12, right? On yeah. um, the Indigenous People's Day. And so um, as I recall in the, in the attorney's um, notes, there was a, a town or a city that did both. Was it Salem? Yeah, so to say, Mr. Diggins. You know, so as I said, when we do the approximation, I mean, I, I, I like, I don't like taking things away. I mean, I like adding, you know, and I'm all for, I mean, um, celebrating or acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day. You know, I don't like the notion of, of just completely eradicating uh, Columbus Day. Uh, I've had a conversation with Mr. Pusey, and I've had conversations with other people, uh, and I just wanna float this idea, you know, uh, is, is that we um, do an Indigenous Peoples Month, I mean, uh, and, and, it's, and really we acknowledge me, the importance of Indigenous people and keep Columbus Day, you know, uh, and, and, and because I mean, that's a part of the historical records, a part of our existence, really. You know? And so regardless of what happens, I mean, I'd like to see us just be bolder. We may be the first municipality in the, in the state to do it, but I think it's a worthy cause, uh, whatever we do here. Um, so uh, as I kind of want these lines, I'll go to, I think it's 85, which is the proclamation. I mean, I, yes, I mean, uh, Mr. Corsi is right. I mean, we did change things in the, the proclamation regarding the um, land acknowledgement. Uh, uh, as I said, I mean, when we discussed this, I mean, there are any number of things that can um, be acknowledged at the beginning of a meeting. And, uh, I 
don't like the notion of devoting that space to this topic only because there are any number of worthy topics that we can acknowledge at the beginning of a meeting. And I think that should be up to the chairs of uh, those meetings and the committees uh, to do whatever acknowledgement that they want. And also, I mean, there's just something that's getting a little bit close to um, prayer territory for me on this. So I think that's what kind of gets me in the end with this. I mean, now it's a resolution uh, and I'm inclined to let resolutions go through. Uh, but I'd have a question to Mr. Heim. If I were to want to have a statement indicating the way that I may vote on the resolution, do I need to make the gist of that statement in this meeting or can I just say, look, I mean, as a board, we will vote positive action on it, but in the statement that comes out, I have my own um, statement that wasn't necessarily made here. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. And uh, if I could just take the opportunity to acknowledge that uh, uh, Mr. Cunningham uh, did the lion's share of the work on, on these uh, specific four articles. So it's particularly appropriate uh, to uh, be uh, to express gratitude for his hard work on these. Uh, Mr. Diggins, uh, typically speaking, the board um, uh, either uh, expresses a uh, majority opinion that might have some nuance to it, or it expresses, you know, it's a four to one vote or a three to two vote and the minority of the board was concerned about A, B, and C. So uh, when I draft a comment, I can certainly draft uh, a comment with nuance noting uh, a, that the board discussed these things, this specific concern was raised, things of that nature. Uh, it can be a little bit tricky depending on how strong the rest of the board feels about something. But um, you'll see in uh, the draft vote and comment, you'll have the opportunity to approve it or say, you know, I'd really like to have this concern raised a little bit more. Does the board feel okay with my my concern being highlighted a little bit more or maybe toned down depending on how well I capture it? Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so on um, Juneteenth uh, day, I mean, I forget the number. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I understand the financial aspect to things, we, but, but it, um, yeah, I'm all for more time off. Uh, and, and I think that's an important holiday to acknowledge. We, uh, uh, we, at this point, we, it seems like we have a holiday every month except for, for August. We, uh, and, and so, um, uh, and, and for most of the salary people, we know how that goes. I mean, uh, we, we get the day off, but we still get to do the work we, uh, in, in another four days. We, and so the productivity tends to remain the same. But, but no, I mean, it's, it's, it's an important uh, thing. To, it's an important uh, part of our history to acknowledge. We, and, and so I, I am very much supportive of that one. Was that it? I believe there's um, the uh, resolution with respect to Indigenous Peoples Day, Mr. Uh, Deans. Oh, okay. Hey, uh, so, so, yeah. I mean, it's kind of on the light lines of um, what I said about the holiday. So, I don't think I need to repeat anything at this point. Thank you. I would just say, yeah, I'm happy to support these. You know, it's just natural extension from the discussion we had a few weeks back, and we had some pretty moving presentations at that time on why there's a need to make the change. I just say to Ms. Dickens's point, which I've had discussions with a number of people about Indigenous Peoples Day, and I mean, there's still a state holiday of Columbus Day. So if somebody so chooses to to celebrate Columbus Day, then they can do so. But I think what we're doing here is recognizing, you know, the injustice that Indigenous peoples incur, incurred and still do incur to this day as a result with these actions. And I'm happy to support this. And you know, I think Juneteenth, we've learned about this day a lot in the past few years, and it's probably one of the most important days in American history that no one ever knew about. Um, so you know, I think it's again long past time to start recognizing that day as well. So I'm happy to support that one as well. All right, so Attorney Heim, we have a motion to approve articles 12, 13, 85, and 86, which has been seconded. So we'll start with article 
12. Oops, sorry. Sure. I'm sorry. This is a public hearing. Yep. This is a public hearing. Uh, so if there's any members of the public that wish to speak on Article 12, 13, 85, or 86, please use the raise hand function on your Zoom application at this time. Carl Wagner, Lynette Martin, Elizabeth Dray. Right, we'll start with Carl Wagner. All right, Mr. Wagner. If you could just I just unmuted me. myself, hopefully, and I'm just turning on my video. Hopefully, you can see and hear me. We can see you. If you can say your name for the record. Carl and Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road, Arlington. Uh, thanks for hearing me. I just wanted to say uh, I thought those were great words from the newest member of the select board, and I really want to uh, congratulate Mr. Diggins in his comments. I think they're exactly the right thing. I encourage the board, especially since you're not spending any money, I think, to not take anything away, but to add, especially where uh, there have been injustices. So I, I really think those were great comments, and I hope any approval of, of the the last uh, uh, proposal would not take anything away from uh, from what the people of Arlington expect to have. Thank you. Thank you. We have Lynette Martin. All right, Ms. Martin, if you could say your name for the record. Hi, my name is Lynette Martin. I'm a um, second generation Italian American. Um, my grandparents came here from Sicily. As a proud Italian American, I want to say I'm completely supportive of changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. I disagree um, with the assertion that we should be celebrating both holidays. Um, Columbus Day celebrates um, the memory of somebody who um, committed tons of crimes against our indigenous peoples um, and nations here in the United States. And um, I feel like saying that we should celebrate both and not turn our backs from one of them is similar to saying, you know, we should put up a Black Lives Matter flag and also keep up Confederate flags. Um, so I hope that in making this change, we also are facing, um, you know, the difficult parts of our history and um, by um, not keeping Columbus Day, that is a statement from our town um, that we recognize these histories and um, I want to make some reparations by changing the name to, to honor our indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Elizabeth Ray. Oh, did Ms. Ray put her hand down? Yes, yeah. Okay. We have Rajiv Sanaya. Hi, Mr. Sanaya, would you just say your name for the record? Sure, it's my name is Rajiv uh, Soneja, not Soneha. Um, I am a member of the Arlington Human Rights Commission, although I speak in a personal capacity. I would like to uh, reiterate my support for um, replacing Columbus Day with the Indigenous Peoples Day holiday. Um, the reason being, um, I have worked with uh, Drake Busey on this resolution and uh, we were part of the team that worked on bringing this pro proclamation to the select board. We worked extensively with uh, people of Native American origin who spoke about the pain and the um, erasure of their history for hundreds of years which was perpetrated by uh, Christopher Columbus. So um, it's part of recorded history that is for the genocide. It was a cultural devastation they have suffered. And uh, recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day is a, is a way in some small measure to address that uh, in Asia. So for us to say that we are going to celebrate both holidays is almost um, inhumane, I would say. So. We have to acknowledge what's happened in the past and the way to do it is to replace the holiday for the observance of Columbus Day. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like at this point, all hands are down. If any additional people, 
Members of the public would like to speak. Let us know now. All right, we have Elizabeth Dre. Hi, good evening, Elizabeth Dre. Um, I was not intending to speak uh, to support um, these articles because I really didn't think that it would be needed. But I, I can't let the, the idea that one of the reasons to support the passing of, or the celebrating of Juneteenth is because it's a, another day off. I'm really emotional. I, you can probably hear it in my voice, but I, I found that to be incredibly um, offensive. It is an important holiday and it needs to be celebrated for what it is and not because we get a day off. Thank you. And with that, that will close the public comment portion. All right. And I will look back to the board. Do you have any additional comments, questions on any of these articles for the proponent? Mr. Pusey? Hi, thank you. I just wanted to make one note in response to the idea of um, <clears throat> why is it a day and a replacement and not Indigenous Peoples Month? And I think um, the, the, the key reason for that is that in 1990, 120 indigenous nations agreed that this was what they wanted. And to, um, so it is, a, it is a concerted plan, uh, which is important because if we, if some people celebrated Independence Day and other people celebrated Independence Month, it would, so, or, or on different dates, it would dilute the awareness, right? So, so to, to have it all consistent is very important. That's all I wanted to say. Any additional comments, questions from the board? All right, with that, Attorney Heim, we will take Article 12. Mr. Chair, if I may, at each article, just uh, articulate my understanding of the board's position. Um, and, and if there's any clarifications that folks want to make, um, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that I understand them. Sure. Um, so my understanding on Article 12 is that the board um, uh, votes in support of amending the town's bylaws section holidays to strike the word uh, Columbus Day and insert Indigenous Peoples Day, known as the state and federal holiday uh, Columbus Day. I do want to reiterate my appreciation for uh, uh, Drake's uh, point about uh, what the Human Rights Commission would, would, would prefer. Uh, again, I think this is purely a function of, uh, as Mr. DeCourcy noted, uh, purely a function of making sure that it's clear that there aren't two separate holidays for the purposes of town personnel uh, and that, that this is essentially uh, a state holiday that town personnel are required to have off or some version of off. Um, and we're, we're trying to reconcile the important message that's being uh, uh, projected here about Indigenous Peoples Day uh, with the understanding that it's in the context of, of a state and federal holiday that, that, will, that occurs at the same time. But other than that, my understanding is that there's uh, unanimous support for this. Um, and I've got a, a good sense of, of the board's um, feeling about how important this is as, a, um, as, as something that we're trying to recognize for the reasons that Human Rights Commission has articulated. Yes. If the board has any comments or contradictions to Attorney Heim's comments, you can speak out. Okay. With that said, I, I'm, I'm ready for the board's vote. Um, yep. So Good. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. All right, and with that, we are ready for article 13. Uh, Mr. Uh, Heard, I think this is it's fairly straightforward. Um, so I don't see any need for clarification or amendments. I'll, I'll, I'll certainly, uh, yep. I think 
put the board's comments in as a and them. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. I'm oh, sorry, I don't have that one. Which one is? The... This is uh, the Juneteenth insertion. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 definitely. Yes, thank you. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote on Article 13. All right. And that takes us to Article 86. My understanding. Sorry. Five, Mr. Chair. Yep. So my understanding is that the board unanimously, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say that. The board uh, supports this article, but uh, would like the acknowledgement to be consistent with the acknowledgement that the board had previously um, endorsed uh, for the board's internal purposes and the previous uh, matter before it. Um, if that's correct, then I'll I'll be ready to take your your votes. Yeah. So I would just say. It, I don't think we had any change to the actual language of the land acknowledgement. It was just consistent that it was saying certain public meetings, but yeah, it, it's consistent with the language in the proclamation. Yep. Okay. Right. I think we're ready for a vote. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Right. And now that will take us to Article 86. On Article 86, um, I think I've got what I need. Um, so I'll, unless there's any corrections or clarifications that members of the board would like to make. OK. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right. And thank you, Mr. Pusey. Thank you very much. All right. So that will take us to Article 78. And I have here, so this is Ms. Malofchuk. Ms. Ms. Malofchik with us? Officer, I'm going to promote your article, but since they're two relatively separate items, your, Article 78 and Article 89, you can present on Article 78. We'll turn to the board for any questions or comments, and then we'll do Article 89 right after while you're with us, if that works. So <laughs> confused. So first I present on trees, then questions, and then the next one. Right, so, so we're, we're gonna do the two article, Warren article here and separately. So you, this is just article 78. Okay, all right. Um, okay. Um, thank you. Beth Malofchek, uh, Russell Street, town meeting member, precinct, precinct nine. Um, we reside and are convened tonight on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts nation and indigenous people uh, formerly residing here. They live sustainably with the environment. Let us learn from that model. I seek to have town meeting vote on a resolution to declare Arlington's tree canopy a public health resource. I respectfully ask for your support. As I stated to the tree committee um, a week or so ago, I seek to raise awareness in the Arlington community as to the importance of our tree canopy. I seek to support the work of Tim Lequeve, Arlington's tree warden, and I seek to support the work of the Arlington Tree Committee. 
All of this we accomplish by the greater Arlington community being aware of the importance of trees to our mental and physical well being. We also gain from the tree canopy's contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gases. All of these factors contribute to the community's public health. Let's demonstrate to the children and the grandchildren, we are after all answerable to them. Let us demonstrate our covenant with our immediate natural resources and recognize Arlington's tree canopy as the public health resource it is. In the scientific journal, Urban Forestry and Urban Greening, they examine whether the public health benefits of urban trees are greater than the biophysical benefits, carbon sequestration, reduction of heat islands, et cetera. They found failure to account for the public health benefits of the tree canopy can lead to underinvestment in the tree canopy. We see this in marginalized neighborhoods and cities and neighborhoods of um, people of color and poor sections of towns. Um, um, COVID-19 has emphasized the importance on an immediate level that people in the community have access to safe green spaces. Some are fortunate to have their own yards, others live near parks and pocket parks. Trees play a critical role in our personal and the community's well-being. This is reflected in the work of the Tree Committee and in the science. Greta Thunberg and the UN have stated no less. David Attenborough depicts this in his films. The New York Times article I cited in supporting documentation explains the importance of preserving older trees and heritage trees, not only for their beauty and carbon sequestration capabilities, but for the support and nurturing that they give, that they provide to nearby and surrounding younger and more vulnerable trees. There are decades of university research providing data on the importance of trees and their growth, their role in the health and safety and the quality of a uh, community's life. Um, protect, restore, and fund. And I um, request your support for uh, this resolution. Everything counts, everything what we do counts on this. Thank you. Great, and I will turn to the board, Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Malevchik. I just have a question for you. Um, and then this is from the, the memo we received from town council indicating or, or citing the language in um, Title V, Article 16 of the town bylaws regarding tree protection and preservation. And uh, council has pointed out that the, that, that bylaw essentially agrees with what you're um, attempting to do here. And maybe you disagree with that, but I'd, I'd like you to comment on that in, in terms, if, if you would. Um, what um, you may be missing from this. And, and, and secondly, if you, you're proposing a resolution, but do you have specific language for the resolution for us to consider? The language for the resolution I submitted and had a discussion, an email discussion with, uh, I believe, Doug Heim. And I specifically seek to have the tree canopy recognized as a public health resource. If you can put the tree bylaw up on the screen, share screen so I could see it. I, I'm unfamiliar, uh, I don't have it memorized. I don't recall it, it's, uh, it refers to the tree canopy as a public health resource. I, 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 unfortunately, I don't have it. I have the, the written memorandum here in front of me, but I don't have anything I can share with you. Does, does Doug Heim perhaps have that? I can't. I can't react to the bylaw when I can't see it. Sorry, I'm not that adept at the computer. I, I think I can bring it up if you give me one second, Mr. Chairman. I did present this to the tree canopy, and a majority of the, I mean, the tree committee rather, and a majority of them were supportive of it and enthusiastic about it. Mr. DeCourcy, is this the section that you were referencing? I, I, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the language from the from the memorandum. Um, is specifically the first, well, both sentences. It yeah, doesn't say, yes, it doesn't say anything about public health. I see nothing, I don't, I do not see the words public health in there. Okay, and when you brought this forward, well, it, it sounds like you weren't aware of the, of the specific language. Um, I'm wondering if you did have a conversation about 
perhaps putting that into the bylaw as opposed to having a separate resolution. I wasn't involved with the tree committee when this bylaw was written. And um, when I mentioned this to the tree committee okay, about 10 days or so ago, um, that didn't come up. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Diggins? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I think Mr. Corsi has kind of headed along the lines that I am. I mean, um, with resolutions, I mean, unless they are, I think, harmful to town meeting, um, do a disservice to town meeting, I am going to let them go. I'm, I'm going to vote approval of them because of the nature uh, in which um, uh, resolutions are treated in town meeting. But they bring up often mean a uh, worthwhile issue. Need. And so what I hope to get out of these is, is what can we do now uh, to deal with this issue? Me, so, so I would like to um, ask you, me, what, if this um, resolution passes, me, what can we do? And, um, if it doesn't pass, and, um, what, what can we do? And, um, me, what more do you think we should do? That, that's a question to me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, through the chair to you. Um, I seek to raise awareness in Arlington, among the community, how comprehensive all of this is, respect for the environment, but specifically the role of the tree canopy, which the tree committee and the tree warden are doing very, very admirable work to um, protect. Uh, but I seek to raise awareness among the Arlington community, among the electorate, among those who don't vote. Uh, and also, I think it's very important, um, and as, as you kind of referred to about the resolutions, to afford town meeting our elected representatives, the deliberative body of our municipal government, the opportunity to weigh in on these um, citizen warrant resolutions or citizen warrant article resolutions. Okay, well, thank you. And also, I want to express appreciation for the references that you included with the um, with the with the resolution. Um, They're informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is Mahan. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess what I would say is that um, Ms. Malofchuk has submitted this resolution, and I'm happy for a resolution to go to town meeting. Um, but basically. I see two parts of, of her uh, proposal, which is recognizing Arlington's uh, tree canopy as a public health resource. And we do have, uh, when the uh, tree committee created their town bylaws, it, there's a paragraph that the town manager just recently uh, screen shared regarding the preservation of the tree can canopy and planting of replacement trees. So I think the first part of the way I read it, Ms. Malofchek's um, resolution is agreeing with um, what our tree committee has created through the town bylaw. Uh, and then the second part of your resolution is to take any um, action related thereto. And, and that would be my question to you. Uh, you. You said you presented the tree committee, you agree with what they're doing. Um, what, what, support what they're doing. What is it? I, su me? I support what the tree committee does. Right. So what? What is take take any other uh, any other action there too besides what the tree committee is doing? Let me speak to your first the first part of your comments, if I may. Um, as I understand it, the tree committee's mandate is limited to street trees, and so um, I am looking at. I, I look at um, challenges holistically. And so I'm looking at the tree canopy in Arlington that would include parks and pocket parks and Arlington Great Meadows, which I think is a fabulous resource. Um, but it, I, I'm, I am looking at the tree canopy as a whole, as a public health resource for the community of Arlington. 
so that's to your first the first part of your comments and as far as okay, the, and, and what i would say to that is we also have um the bylaws under the conservation committee commission and the wetlands protection act that's in, adopted in that so what i'm asking you is what beyond that are you suggesting under that we're not doing oh that's a loaded question I attended many concerts. Oh no, it's, it's 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 just it's just a question. I'm you say or take and take any other action related thereto. I'm saying to you, we have a tree committee with their bylaws. We have the conservation commission with uh, what they're charged with and the bylaws that that they oversee. And we have the Wetlands Protection Act and the uh, uh, protection that that affords us. What are we missing that you say you're saying or take any action there? to or you just want to have this resolution to reiterate, reiterate all that which is fine i would like to have this resolution come before town meeting i would like as i said for the deliberative body of municipal government to vote on recognizing arlington's tree canopy as a public health resource as to the language of the resolution if it's incorrect if a comma is out of place again i'm mm -hmm. not an attorney I'm not an expert in municipal government. I'm a tree hugger. And I did have, I did submit the, um, and, and, and seek the advice of Douglas Heim and Mr. Leone. I, I don't know how no, else. No, but all I'm saying to you is, well, what is, what is it you, you're, you're saying you want to submit this, but what are you asking? What's in the resolution beyond what we're already doing? What else should we be doing? I'm not saying that sarcastically. Beyond wetlands protection, conservation well, I believe, community, and tree committee. I, I believe that, you know. No, normally, when you when you talk over someone, you're not listening. So, but go ahead. Just I, I'm I'm fine supporting this, but what is it you're asking us to support? Okay, I apologize for for speaking over you. Um, the conservation commission has a specific parameter of their responsibilities. The Wetlands Protection Act, which I believe we changed in 2019, um, has its own parameters. I think the Conservation Commission does not overlap with the Wetlands Protection Act. Again, I'm not, and I, as I said in the past, I've attended many meetings of the Conservation Commission where they in fact ignored the buffer zone and allowed trees to be cut down. I attended those Spy Pond Lane meetings. So in, in um, listing for us the other committees that we have, and I think it's wonderful we have all of these committees, um, I, I think sometimes there can be stovepiping um, in uh, municipal government, much as there is in federal government, where sometimes committees don't know what, one, when, what other committees are doing you know, unless you're fortunate to have um, members that overlap or um, really illustrative minutes and agendas. So I think there's a need for this resolution. The 15 people who signed the paperwork think so. I've gotten uh, a lot of um, support from neighbors and uh, colleagues. Uh, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I think there's a need for it. That's why I go forth. You know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep. I, I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I just don't understand what your parameters of uh, the revolution are. Uh, uh, resolution is regarding further defining this as a public health resource. Uh, um, and I'll stop there. I, I thought maybe you would provide that, but I'm hearing that that's not something you can do. All right, Mrs. Mahan, we're going to move on to Mr. Dunn here. Okay, All Mr. right. Dunn? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I, so I'm going to first, I'm going to politely uh, disagree with at least one of my colleagues, and I'm going to say uh, it is I. Uh, it's not about the select board uh, passing through um, resolutions for the town meeting to consider. Uh, the good news is it's not even in our power. We can't block this from going to town meeting, even if we wanted to. It's in the town manager act. As soon as you get ten signatures, it goes before town meeting. It's the way it is. I'm total, and I and I support that. To me, what this hearing is about, and what our vote is, is what we recommend the town meeting should do. And um, I, and there are times where the we, where we think about it, we say, you know, we don't have a strong opinion. We should let the town meeting decide. 
and when we if we you know take a pass and we say that all right so be it there will be times when i've probably said that in the past um, most of the time though i think town meeting is best served when we do our jobs well when we have a hearing and uh we and and we, we consider the various voices and then we make a recommendation um and so i currently am not persuaded that this is unique or different than what we already have on the books uh, I think the tree bylaw is pretty clear. I read, went back and I read the open space report um, a little bit before the meeting. Um, I don't, it's, I, I've heard uh, the proponents suggest that uh, we need to, the trees, we need to acknowledge that the tree canopy supports public health. And I think the language, while it doesn't use the words public and health in that order, it clearly indicates public health through everything else that it says. Uh, and I just don't, and, and the other reason to do it would be to publicize the importance of trees. Uh, and while I certainly, uh, you know, I was for many years as the designee to the tree committee, and I certainly support uh, the, uh, a lot of the act of work that they do, um, I don't think that this is the right venue to do that kind of publicity work. So uh, I, if Mr. Hurd, if you're entertaining any motions, I move a recommendation of no action. Done. Um, so I would just say, you know, I agree with the notion that our tree canopy is important. And I would certainly think if it went to town meeting, they would you would probably get the votes to agree with that statement as well. Um, I think like Mr. Dunn said, it's just what is this article creating that hasn't isn't already in place. And I think that's similar to what Mrs. Mahan was trying to get at and where it comes down on is if there's any number of statements or about issues important to the town that we could put put through as a resolution to town meeting to reiterate um, and this being one of them it's just a matter of whether or not we want 30 art resolutions in every town meeting with a quality statement that you know the vast majority of town meeting members agree with already and i think that's what we're looking here with, with this resolution is you know most if not all town meeting members agree with the with the statement that the, our tree canopy is a public health health issue it's just whether or not we need a resolution in order to reiterate that um and so that's just where i am on that all right with that this is a public hearing. We have two hands raised, three hands raised here. A few, okay. We're gonna start with Mona Mandel. All right, Ms. Mandel, if you can just say your name for the record. Hi, my name is Mona Mandel um, and um, I, 14 Water Street, uh, Unit 2, Precinct 9, Town Meeting Member. I speak in support of Citizen Warrant Article um, 78 to have tree canopy as a public health resource. I deeply care about climate change issues, and I really feel that um, our trees are our biggest resource to fight climate change. This is just a resolution to support tree canopy as a holistic way to address it across the various committees that we have and to raise awareness on this topic. So um, if the select board takes a no action vote on this, this also reflects how the select board feels about tree canopy as a public health. Um, so that, that's also a message that you're sending to the community. So. I just wanted to put that out there as well. And I think right now with everything that we're seeing in Texas and all over the world, you know, I think this is something that we are seeing as a community, as a resolution. Um, so I wanted to support this, um, um, uh, the article that Beth has come, brought forward. Thank you very much. And we have Carl Wagner. Hey, Mr. Wagner, if you can say your name for the record. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me and see me. We can. Thank you, Carl Wagner, uh, 30 Edge Hill Road. Um, I wasn't planning to speak on Ms. Milovchik's uh, uh, 
Proposal 78, Tree Canopy is a Public Health Resource. But I, I have to speak to you members of the Select Board honestly and say, why not allow the town meeting, a body of elected officials, just like you five are, four plus one will be five, I hope are, to reiterate what is important, like affordability, tree canopy and open space and uh, wetlands are something that is lost and never gained again. And right now there are forces, including within unelected town officials here, who want to push for the things that could potentially hurt affordability and potentially hurt our tree canopy. And the argument is always made, this is better for the people who live here. But honestly, Ms. Miloshik is 100% right. And I, I thank the earlier commenter also. This doesn't cost you anything, and yet it could cost the people who live here their fresh air and the, the, the open space that they love. And everything that was said by Ms. Malovchik is entirely right. Since the law that you're talking about being the same as what she's giving to the town meeting to speak on was written, developers pay a price per head on trees and the trees get taken down. We've seen this happening over and over again. I believe our representative Garbally is part of a project that's going to take down trees right in the town center. It's very frustrating for people who don't love trees perhaps as much as she does, but we just want air. And given coronavirus, we need air. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And Lynette Culverhouse. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Lynette Culverhouse. Uh, Draper Avenue, uh, town meeting member uh, in precinct 11. I want to thank um, Ms. Malofchek for uh, introducing this article to protect the tree canopy and for the other two people who spoke in favor of it. I am a citizen of the earth and a lover of nature who is deeply concerned about climate change and the impact it has on our planet. This includes everything that has life, including plants and trees. Not everyone in town sees it this way. We need to do more. It saddens me greatly every time I witness trees and green spaces being destroyed to be replaced by man-made structures. While construction of homes is essential, the destruction of trees is optional. Trees are living organisms that absorb carbon dioxide and help to keep our air clean they provide shelter from the scorching sun of summer, from rain and from wind, and they are home to many creatures as well as contributing to our mental and physical well being. They are in a symbi symbiotic relationship with all other living beings. We cannot hurt trees without hurting all living things, including humans. To some of you, this might seem sound sappy, but the science is clear, and I believe that the future of humanity depends on our ability to live in harmony with other species and the natural world. There is a beautiful movie based on science about trees put out by Patagonia. May I suggest that we all watch it to help us grow a deeper respect for the valuable role played by trees in our ecosystem. I would like to urge the board to support this article that seeks to protect our trees that in turn protect and nourish us. Thank you. And Laura Kiesel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, this is Laura Kiesel, Mass Ave, Precinct 6. Uh, I support Beth's um, resolution. I come from a background, I'm an environmental scientist by degree and training, and I used to work for the town of Wellesley's Natural Resources Commission as their environmental education coordinator. I admit I don't know all the bylaws in Arlington, but looking at the one that was just shared on the screen, I do see differences in the nuances of language on that screen and what she's asking for. When you put in a request to have tree canopy considered as a public health resource explicitly, it also calls in line an environmental equity and justice issue in terms of making sure that 
all of the residents throughout um, Arlington or in a given municipality where these kind of resolutions are proposed, which I'm familiar with and other municipalities I've worked with, have access to these resources. A lot of times in a given municipality, they are concentrated in areas where there's more affluence and privilege, and they can over time be deprived of certain areas or neighborhoods where there's less affluence and privilege. And I think um, we're having a lot of conversations here in Arlington about equity and access. And I think tree canopy and the public health resources those offer, especially when we're in the midst of a COVID pandemic, which has disproportionately impact low income people and people of color is particularly important to consider. There was a very important um, peer review study that came out this summer that I would implore the select board to look at by urban ecologist, Chris Schell um, about the importance explicitly of tree canopy as a public health resources. And he looked at urban areas and suburbs that had trees versus less trees and the equity issues there and how if you don't enshrine that in the policy explicitly, how that can have disproportionate impacts. And just on the more local level, there was just an op-ed this past week in Cambridge Day from Black Response Cambridge about affordable housing, but also how a lot of times in that conversation, uh, access to green spaces and tree cover are often not considered or put into local policy. This is just a resolution, but I think when we elevate that, these considerations will come to the forefront of our policy considerations. So thank you for listening. Thank you. We have Eileen Crowder. Yes, hello. Yes, can you say your name for the record? My name is Elaine Crowder, um, to Glenbrook Lane, Unit 17, uh, town meeting member from Precinct 19. Um, I heard the suggestion from the board. I have a question, actually, not a, not a statement. Um, I heard a, a suggestion from the board uh, in, in looking back at um, the bylaws uh, that uh, the possibility of amending the bylaw to add the language um, that uh, Beth is proposing. So that would and, have to be a separate warrant article to amend. Right. The bylaw. So yes. that's that was my question. Is that something number one that the board would entertain? And if so, number two, what would be the uh, the, the way to to do that. Thank you. So, Attorney Heim, I don't think that's a possibility at this point. Correct. That's correct, Mr. Hurd. So the warrant article is is for a resolution. Uh, the resolution can resolve to do a number of things, uh, but it, it it has to would have to advise of an intention to amend the bylaw. May I have my first question answered, please? So the first, we can't do that is the answer. I, Sorry, no, I'm, not, I'm not saying is that, that, I know you can't do that now. I'm saying, is this something that the board would entertain in the future? I think I can't speak on behalf of the board and this is the, a public comment question. So it's not a question and answer, but I think that certainly if someone were to propose it to us and made an argument, sure. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. And so there's no further public comment on this. Are there any additional comments from the board? Mrs. Mahan? I'll second Mr. Dunn's motion. Uh, it, on the basis of um, we have not been provided what the parameters are beyond what we have with the Wetlands Protection Act. Conservation Commission and the Tree Committee. Thank you. Right. Any additional comments, Mr. DeCourcy? No further comments. Mr. Diggins? Oh, I do. So many. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, I, I just wonder, I know now isn't the time, you know, to discuss the philosophy 
uh, of resolutions, you know, but we, my intention is not to uh, shirk my responsibility. And I know that's not what was said. And I know that's not what was intended, you know, because uh, I feel that our deliberation here, we, as it will be um, recorded or some summarized by uh, Mr. Heim will elucidate me our feelings about this resolution. And we can still put it in front of uh, town meeting for the eight minutes that it's going to get. And, uh, and, and so I mean, whether resolutions mean or a good thing is a whole nother thing. And, uh, and, but as I said, I mean, what I like about these at least this one, I mean, is that it brings up an important issue that uh, we can discuss and try to find out what more the town can do. I mean, and so uh, that's it. A little disjointed, but there's more later on. Thanks. Any additional comments, Mr. Dunn? Uh, no, thank you. All right. Yeah, and I would just, again, it sort of reiterate where we were at the beginning of this conversation was that I don't think anybody on the board in any way, shape or form was trying to diminish the importance of our tree canopy. I think that's something that everyone on the board supports and has in many, many, many instances reiterated that support with not just Warren articles, but just different agenda items that have come before us. I think, I think we've always talked about the value of the of our tree canopy and how important it is to the town of Arlington. It's just specifically on this resolution, whether or not this re or resolution to town meeting as drafted adds anything to the discussion and that's what the board will ultimately vote on. All right, with that, Attorney Heim, I think we're ready for a vote. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Um, I'm sorry. It's, um, it's not going the way I thought it was. I think I, I am confused on the motion. So what's the motion to not vote no action? Ten. Okay, so then no. Thanks. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's a four to one vote. All right. Now that will take us, Ms. Malachik, you can stay with us for Article 89. We'll bump that up in our agenda here. So if you can present Article 89 for us. Okay. Um, does that mean, does the resolution still go before town meeting? I'm confused. Mr. Chair, would you like me to? Yeah. So Ms. Malofchek, the board is just making a recommended vote of this board of selectmen, or select board rather. Uh, you would submit a substitute motion if you wanted uh, the um, town meeting to still discuss the resolution. Thank you. All right. So Beth Malofchek, Russell Street, town meeting member, precinct nine. A charge delivered to the African Lodge, June 24th, 1797, at Monotomy by the Right Worshipful Prince Hall, is a document in the collection at the Library of Congress. It inspired me to submit to you a draft warrant article resolution to declare June 24th Prince Hall Day. Democracy is an idea. We believe in democracy. Prince Hall believed in democracy and in the promise it held to the enslaved. Prince Hall made democracy a verb. He was a community organizer. The 16 citizen warrant articles tonight, and I understand there are more, illustrate that Arlington is organizing. We are keeping covenant with democracy and with the intent of the founders, among whom belongs Prince Hall community organizer, civic leader, abolitionist, first black and civil rights leader in America. Prince Hall created the first school organized by black citizens for black children. Prince Hall petitioned the great and general court of Massachusetts to end slavery and end the slave trade 
three years before John Adams drafted the state constitution. And Prince Hall's petition used the language of the Declaration of Independence only six months after the promulgation of the Declaration. He was the first American to publicly use the language of the Declaration of Independence for a political purpose other than war with Britain. Prince Hall is the first African-American made a Mason in America. He met with George Washington July 2nd, 1775 in Cambridge to appeal to him to allow African-Americans to enlist in the Revolutionary Army. July 3rd, he organized and founded the African Lodge in Boston, now known as Prince Hall Grand Lodge. Prince Hall, a civic leader, a human rights advocate, an abolitionist in the 18th century, he demonstrated to Boston, to Massachusetts, that Black Lives Matter. It is fitting, it is time, to declare June 24th Prince Hall Day in Monotomy in Arlington, where he delivered a charge urging his brethren to see the suffering, to have compassion, to not lose hope, to assist the community and to do so respectfully. He describes slavery, the passage, and entreats his brethren to let Boston know, to let Boston know. I ask you to let Arlington know. I respectfully ask the select board to support this resolution. I urge the select board, if it is in with, if it is within their power, to declare June 24th Prince Hall Day. Please allow town meeting the opportunity to afford Prince Hall the respect and recognition he deserves. Uh, and again, I look forward to presenting this to town meeting that the elected representatives of the Arlington community, our deliberative body. Uh, to offer them the opportunity to support this re resolution. This is a community effort. I may have filed the papers, at least 15 people signed them. Many audience members here tonight and some who are unable to attend did research and discussed with me Prince Hall's legacy. Rosalind Shaw published a letter to the editor in your Arlington I relied on Danielle Allen's article in The Atlantic and on the material and speeches from Cambridge's 2009 dedication of their monument. I discussed with Alan Jones, a member of the local Mystic Valley Lodge, himself a Mason, and I conferred with librarians at the Scottish Rite Masonic Museum in Lexington. Um, let us highlight Prince Hall Cemetery in East Arlington. Let us inform the Arlington community as to Prince Hall's significance to our community and to the history of the establishment of this experiment in democracy as we approach the 250th anniversary of the events of 1775. We remain a democracy as of yet imperfect, but with many supporters. Um, there are eight black masons buried in the cemetery on Gardner Street. Um, Prince Hall Day is envisioned as a first step in education, in an education effort. We hope to organize a speaker series and to support the inclusion of Prince Hall and his legacy in the school curricula. And Professor Danielle Allen, and professor of ethics at Harvard, has a grade eight curricula. We're in touch with her. She uh, sent us an email today and I will be conferring with her assistance on this curricula and standalone courses that she has. So, thank you. Thank you. With that, I will turn to the board. Mrs. Mahan. Move approval. All right. And Mr. DeCorsi. Yeah, I'll, I'll set that and just a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank Ms. Malofchuk for bringing this forward. Um, I did, uh, in, in providing information, I found Professor Allen's uh, article um, to, to be a, to, an excellent article. I also did a lot of research on what City Councilor Simmons, or then Mayor Simmons, did in Cambridge in developing 
the Prince Hall Memorial, which is on Cambridge Common, uh, probably 10 yards from the monument to George Washington addressing the Continental Army. And I just have a question for you. As you brought this forward, um, Prince Hall Day, I'm just wondering, was there any consideration of um, proposing a monument much the way Cambridge did, um, either in addition or, or, um, or not, not in lieu of, but, but as an alternative to, to the print day. And I'm just wondering if you, um, how, how your thought process went forward on selecting a day as opposed to maybe a process to, for a monument. My, first of all, I was very inspired when I read this, um, a charge because it so speaks to events happening today and happening over the course of the last decade and longer, as we all know, in the United States. Um, I found it very inspiring. I found the language applicable. And my first thought was the speaker series, but because I, I believe in living monuments, I believe in monuments that are going to inform and educate and create discourse. So, um, but then I got to thinking and I, and, I, and I met Alan Jones and Elizabeth Carr Jones on Robbins Hill one day when I was up there walking and had just read a charge and we got into a conversation about it. I didn't even know at that point that he was a Mason. And so we shared our enthusiasm for it. And I said, you know, speaker series would be great. People need to know about this. And then I got to thinking that before a speaker series, the first step would be a day, a day to honor this, this towering figure of the revolutionary era, particularly as we approach 2025 and the 250th year anniversary of the events of 1775. Let's create this day and include this meritorious individual in our history. No one knows about him. No one knows that he's done these things. Um, so I think, as I said, the first step is this day. I chose June 24th because that is the day that he gave this speech in Monotomy. So that's our connection besides the cemetery. Um, so we have the day, then a speaker series. There's a lot of enthusiasm for that among the Masons have expressed support for that. And I spoke to George Parsons of the Arlington Historical Society, and um, he found the idea engaging. Um, and then I think it's very important, the development of the school curriculum. And Danielle Allen, the professor at Harvard, already has a grade eight model that meets the state standards for what they need to study in grade eight, the different philosophers and writers, and then posing with, um, well, I, I, we've just exchanged that particular email today, but I, I'm eager to share that with you. Thank you. And just one other, have you had any contact with the Prince Hall Masons from the Dorchester Lodge? Or? Yes, I have written to them. I have not heard back from them. I heard it, that that can be, um, challenging. But I also contacted the uh, NAACP and exchanged emails with um, them. And they put me in touch with Pearl Morrison and Barbara Bolt, longstanding members of the NAACP uh, from Arlington. And they support this initiative. Thank you very much. I may I also point out that two houses up from me, 28 Russell Street, is where the Arlington Civil Rights Committee had its first meetings in the 70s. This is another thing that no one knows. That's my next project. I'd like to get the Historical Society interested in um, doing some recordings if we can find any of the people still around. Right. Mr. Diggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and so a uh, question through you to um, Ms. Belovchik. And So my understanding is that there is an, uh, an event on Memorial Day uh, in which we, there's a commemoration of sorts we, to um, Mr. Hall. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that the Grand uh, Prince Hall Grand Lodge 
meets and I don't know where they where they initiate their um, stepping out, but then they march to the cemetery um, on Gardner Street and then a uh, personage from the Arlington Historical Society gives a speech. Rosemary Smerzinski's speech of 2019 was very, very moving. And I, um, uh, George Parsons said that he would relay my admiration for her speech to her. I, I was unable to get in touch with her through their website. Um, but this is different. I, I seek to create a living monument. That's, it was more just a, a point of information. It wasn't really, again, uh, an argument against doing this because I'm for it. I mean, all, all I will ask is that the, uh, that the day be kept in memory. Oh, yeah. Me, yeah. And so I, I hear that you uh, have a speaker series, but but maybe not every year, maybe every X number of years, something is done me so that the, the day is remembered because I don't know if we have um, done resolutions or proclamations creating other days and it may be my lack of connectedness that I'm not aware of those other days, but I hope this isn't something that happens in 2021 and is forgotten in 2051. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thought it was a really uh, excellent proposal and I really liked the detail and I really liked what I learned and I like that there is a lot more to learn and uh, I'm happy to support this resolution. Thank you. Yep. And I'm happy to support this as well. I think Ms. Molovchuk had emailed me a while back now about this and you know, I looked at the materials and did a little more research on research on Prince Hall and it's certainly a worthy person to recognize in this manner so I thank you for bringing this forward you're welcome he's in the pantheon of founders and that needs to be known sure thank you all right so at this point we will open up for public comment we have three comment commenters for now the first will be Elaine Crowder I'm sorry, I had already promoted uh, Rebecca Gruber, who was first. Oh, sorry. It dropped off my list, that's why. All right, Ms. Gruber. Thank you. Rebecca Gruber, Pleasant Street, Precinct 8. Um, well, you're all in support of this, so I'll be very brief, um, since it doesn't seem like you need much convincing. Um, I will say that over the last year or so, I know that Arlington has initiated several efforts towards ending racial discrimination in our town and towards creating a more diverse, equitable, and welcoming community. And I applaud these actions to improve our present and to ensure a better future. Um, this is about not ignoring our history though. How wonderful that our history includes the personage of Prince Hall. Um, many of you have referred to uh, Professor Daniel Allen, a political philosopher and the James Bryant Conant University professor at Harvard's work. And she describes Prince Hall as the embodiment of black agency. She promotes the value of featuring a man of color in the founding of our country. And she reminds us that understanding his black experience gives the fullest, richest picture of what freedom is, why it means something, and why we all need to hang on to it with all intensity and power. And as uh, Ms. Malachik has said, Professor Allen is aware of and excited by this effort in Arlington to establish Prince Hall Day. The Prince Hall Cemetery on the National Register of Historic Places located in Arlington honors Prince Hall community activist, abolitionist, and leader in the free black community of 18th century America, allowing Arlington to claim a special connection to this important historical figure. And by resolving to declare June 24th as Prince Hall Day, Arlington further honors our town's connection to a man who fought for liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I am gonna interrupt the citizen forum for one moment and entertain a motion to allow our meeting to go past 
our 11 o'clock p.m. deadline. If we have a motion from the board. So moved. We grudge yes, or second. All right. So we have a motion by Mr. Dickens, seconded by Mrs. Mahan. Attorney Heim. Mrs. Mahan. I would say yes, and if you got the yes vote, please keep that in mind. Uh, Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Dickens? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. All right, and Elaine Crowder is the next. Yep. Ms. Crowder, if you could just say your name for the record. Elaine Crowder to Glenbrook town meeting member from precinct 19. Um, I, I will also abbreviate my, my remarks. Um, I enjoyed learning about Prince Hall when uh, Beth mentioned that this is uh, part of the town's legacy. One thing that hasn't been mentioned is um, that in 1868, Arlington Town Meeting approved uh, locating the Prince Hall mystic cemetery in town as the final resting place for Prince Hall and his fellow Masons. Over 150 years later, his legacy really has newfound relevance for our town. Um, town meeting can play a pivotal role today in elevating awareness of this important local change maker. As Beth mentioned, Prince Hall is a spiritual leader, a civic leader who established African-American Freemasonry in Boston and an abolitionist nearly 100 years before the Civil War. He was a patriot and many Arlingtonians today don't know his name as I didn't. So I see the resolution to establish June 24th as Prince Hall Day in Arlington as being something that would change that. Thank you. And Mr. Wagner. Thank you, uh, Carl Wagner, 30 Ed Show Road. Very briefly, because it sounds like you're going to rightly support this, a couple politically salient points to make. First of all, I believe it's Black History Month, so congratulations for saying yes to this, as I hope you will do. Uh, secondly, in uh, in following the words of Mr. DeCourcy, thank you for the select board's uh, preliminary uh, support for some kind of statue, which I think would be great in Arlington. Uh, I don't believe we have any statues to black men in Arlington. Let's do it. Uh, thirdly, uh, there was some concern perhaps about taking away from Memorial Day. And first of all, I just point out that everybody listening or watching the recording should go to the arlingtonhistorical.org website because there are like 24 years of great uh, speeches that are, are, are listed there and you can read them. And they are informational and um, em emotional as well as uh, informational. Uh, and also, uh, I wanted to point out uh, that the in addition to Memorial Day, uh, Beth's Day would give a second day. And there's a third day, which we probably don't want to put his day on. That is, he was probably born on September 12th, 1735 or 1738. We already have a town day, and town day comes right around the time of our other great Arlingtonian, Uncle Sam, who was born on the, um, on the 13th of 1766. Last point to make politically salient is that if we get this going in town meeting and they say yes, fast enough, and we talk about maybe doing something for a statue or a memorial, uh, 1735 or 1738 was his birthday. And both of those have nice years coming up soon, either five year or 10 year anniversaries from his birth date. So this could all be stuck in in a really nice way to commemorate some five year or 10 year anniversary of his birth, depending on what that is. So I hope you'll support this. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mr. Sonija. Hi, can I speak now? Yes. Hi, this is Rajiv Sonija, member of the Arlington Human Rights Commission. Although I speak in a personal capacity, resident of Mary Street. Um, I also don't want to reiterate uh, all the comments many speakers have made before me, and I'm glad to hear that it seems like 
the members of the select board are inclined to support this uh, article. I also want to uh, support, uh, express my support for this article. And I'm very happy to hear today, uh, continuing on the theme of supporting historical aspects of this nation, um, honoring Indigenous Peoples Day, commemorating Juneteenth. We look to commemorate Prince Hall Day as well. It's very important for our nation and our uh, children to um, understand that this uh, historical aspect of this country was founded by many diverse people and not just people of European ancestry. And to finally end, I just want to qu uh, quote, uh, which is of a special relevance to our town. Last year um, on May 30th, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, the Arlington Human Rights Commission quoted Prince Hall um, in their commemoration. Um, and they said, give the right hand of affection and fellowship to whom it justly belongs. Let their color and complexion be what it will. Let their nation be what it may, for they are your brethren and it is your indispensable duty so to do. So I thank the select board for considering this article and I hope to um, see it voted in town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Bergman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I also would like to speak in favor of this resolution. Um, a few things that you should know. Well, first of all, know anything about Prince Hall. I didn't know anything about the participation of Black Americans in the Revolutionary War, even though I spent a whole year learning about it when I was in fifth grade. And um, that's why I think it's really important to commemorate him with his own day rather than sharing it on Memorial Day. Um, we've too often made our black heroes invisible and it's been missing from our history. So it's really important to call attention to Prince Hall. Um, a few things you may not know about him, he fought at Bunker Hill. He, a hundred years before Frederick Douglass, he called for the abolition of slavery and for unalienable rights for all men, including black men. And um, he is considered by having created the Mason Lodge for the black Americans to have created the first official institution, black institution in America. So I think he's very important and I'm glad that you are all in favor of this resolution. Thank you very much. And I think I forgot to say that I'm in, on Park Avenue. Thank you. All right, and that is all our public speakers. Do you have any additional comments from the board? Seeing none, Attorney Heim. Mr. Hurd, just so we're clear, um, I think based on the board's comments, what I'll do is work with Ms. Malopchek to assemble uh, something in a resolution format. Sure. Um, and codify the comments of the board. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous vote. Could I just correct for the record, Prince Hall is not buried in the Arlington Cemetery. He's buried in Boston on Copps Hill. Thank you. Yes, yes, I know that. I actually grew up on Gardner Street and Memorial Way and then Fremont Street. And right. I actually have been down there for cleanups, but there are seven or eight, um, I believe African-American Freemasons who are buried there. So definitely yes. knew that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malopchik. That will take us to Article 79, Resolution Encouragement of Energy Efficient and or Sustainable Energy Installations in Historic Districts. Asserted by Sue Doctorow. Ms. Doctorow with us? Hi. Hi, Ms. Doctorow. If you can just tell I, us I, your article. Yeah, um, I, love, I just want to say I love that last discussion and I thank you too for supporting the Prince Hall Day. It's really wonderful. 
Um, okay, so this, this article, I'm Sue Doctrow. I live at 99 Westminster Ave. I'm a town meeting member for Precinct 21, and I'm a resident of the Mount Gilboa Historic District, and I appreciate your consideration of this um, resolution. We uh, sent a memo that's in your package, so I'll refer to it, but I'm not gonna summarize it in detail to save time. I'm just gonna touch on a few points and mention a couple others. Um, the resolution that we seek would be to encourage the Arlington Historic Districts Commission, which I'm gonna call AHDC, to approve all clean energy projects that do not irreversibly change, that is do not destroy historic architecture. Um, mostly addressing solar panels, but the intent is also to include heat pumps. Uh, based on discussions I had recently with people from Bedford, um, our HDC is relatively welcoming already to solar panel projects, and I think we can be proud of that. Um, in Bedford, the first parish church had to go to court to install panels on their historic buildings. Um, so some solar uh, panel projects are approved by RAHDC, while others are not. Projects that don't show from the street are probably a fare the best, um, but our HDC clearly also approves some panels that do not, that, that do show from the street. When the commission has not approved them, the reasons have included that the panels would not match the roof color or the panels could not be placed in a regular rectangle because of dormers and other structures. And um, this irregular pattern was often regarded as unsightly, described as jagged and mosaic in some of the hearings. But recently I learned that these standards do not always seem to be consistent. So there's one recent example and that's in the memo that showed unanimous approval of a project that shows from the street, but the panels don't match the roof. The roof is red and they didn't have a regular array. So I was really glad to see that the recent project was approved and maybe it indicates that the views of the commissioners are moving toward more lenience um, in the design standards. But it also leaves me with some sympathy for the people whose projects were rejected before because of roof color and irregular patterns. So um, a successful vote by town meeting on this resolution, I think would at least convey a message that many of us believe that, this, that climate crisis is urgent and Arlington is committed to net zero carbon emissions and we believe that clean energy projects should be of a very high priority with fewer impediments, even in our historic districts. So I think this is why Sustainable Arlington voted last year when we first introduced this before the pandemic, Sustainable Arlington voted to support this article. Um, and also, as I noted in the memo, we really appreciate that the Clean Energy Future Committee is including study of this issue in the Net Zero Action Plan. So as a resolution, of course, this would be voluntary. It removes no authority from the AHDC. Um, town Council advises that town meeting does not have the power to create a bylaw that would exempt solar panels from HDC review. Um, this was actually demonstrated in Bedford in 2018. Um, the Attorney General rejected a bylaw change that was voted in overwhelmingly at their special town meeting. Their bylaw would have enabled certain solar panel projects without HDC review. Um, but, you know, it was rejected by the Attorney General because of the conflict with state law. So, um, interestingly, because of the way the state law is written, Arlington has been able to exempt paint colors and importantly, the color of roofing materials from HDC review. I just wanted to mention that because as I noted, some solar panel projects have not been allowed because the panels would not match the roof color. So color seems to be an important factor in some of these decisions. So um, I'll end here, but anyway, thank you for listening and I hope that you'll support some positive action on this article. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so hey, for the reasons I have stated earlier, I am going to support this. We, it's, it's. I understand that that we, you understand the limitations made of what can be accomplished uh, with with this. We, um, if nothing else, we hopefully we someone from the A H R D. Uh, HDC. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Even if my brain wasn't fried, I would have gotten that it's one. It's kind of late. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. And uh, uh, it'd be interesting to hear them me, uh, make the argument against it. So so uh, they'll have four minutes. You'll have four minutes. Me, uh, have at it. Yeah. Is there a question? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to second uh, Mr. Diggins' motion. And thank you, Mr. Doctor, for the... Uh, um, for the presentation, and I think it's it's worth hearing from town meeting on this issue and, and realizing that the um, historic district commission still has has authority here. But thank you for uh, staying up with us here on a, another late night at the select board. Mrs. Mahan, no question. I'm, I'm in favor. Thank you. Thanks, and Mr. Dunn. Uh, ironically, I actually wish that they were here to argue now because I think uh, I know. I wish they'd come. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the, to me that's the point of the, the you know that's the point of these hearings is uh, you make a better resolution, you make a better article, and that's what uh, a more efficient use of town meetings time. Um, I the however the, the merits of the article as or the resolution, excuse me, as proposed certainly makes sense to me, and I'm happy to support it. You don't know that they aren't here to argue this. Um, all right, and I'll support it as well. I think this is you know, touching on a really important subject in town where we've gone through, we've talked about historic structures earlier in this meeting. And one of the things that Mr. Helmuth said jokingly at the time was that they're happy at the Jason Russell House to put a more efficient heating system that isn't at risk mm -hmm. to burn the building down. And so I think that this competing interest with, with historic structures and this sustainability is something that is really important to everyone in Arlington. So I, I will support this resolution as well. At this time, we will open this up to public comment. We have two raised hands right now. We have Stephen Makauka. Mr. McCauka, can you hear us? Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Steve McCauka, um, live on Russell Street, Precinct 9. I'm chair of the Arlington Historic Districts Commission. So we are here, and I'm not here to argue. Um, we haven't met as a commission about this resolution, so these are my personal thoughts. Um, but first, I just want to say thank you to Ms. Doctro for her civic engagement across the years. She's been to many of our hearings, um, and I always find her to be very thoughtful, so I appreciate her thoughts here. I did want to just say a couple of things to um, you know, put on the record. Um, I think as a commission, we've been very supportive of energy efficiency uh, where it's appropriate. Um, and I think what's really important here is something that was in the materials you had that said that often the issues are site specific questions and challenges of how to accomplish energy efficiency at the same time as um, accomplishing the goal of preserving historic structures and historic legacy in town. I think we try really hard to do that. We develop guidelines that give a pathway to applicants on how to get there, how we can find common ground. And I think we work really hard with applicants in the hearings to find common ground, but often it's site specific, it's project specific, um, you know, language like any application get approved, I think is difficult because of the specific situations that come up that need to be considered individually. Um, and I just wanna end by saying that I think that I cannot think of any heat pump or mini split that we've denied in um, historic district, we've required that they be sited along the side of the house and perhaps be screened as opposed to, I've had a couple of people say, we won't install them in our front yard. 
And we think that that's inappropriate in the historic district. Um, but we worked with the applicant to find a way of making that work. And in terms of solar panels, we've approved 19 installations at least. And I think I've missed some in my um, going back through the record here at home. There have been a couple that have been denied, but I think those are for specific reasons that are laid out in the guidelines. And at least, you know, we, I, I can think of only three. And one of those were um, where the applicant proposed to take off very significant historic features from the house in order to accomplish and they weren't willing to be flexible and try to accommodate. So I think that we are generally very much support energy efficiency where appropriate. And we try to work when we, as much as we can with the applicants to reach that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. All right, and Beth Malachek. Ms. Malovchik, if you just say your name for the record. Beth Malovchik, uh, Russell Street. I actually live right across the street from Steve Makoga. <laughs> He's in an R2, I'm in R4. Um, and I'm on the Arlington Historic District Commission. Uh, recent appointee. I don't think I'm there yet a year. Um, I'd like to thank Sue Doctorow for uh, pursuing and bringing this resolution forward. I think it's timely. I, I, um, I look forward to discussions on uh, the issues that, that Sue's raised and to refining the guidelines so that applicants um, maybe find the whole process less onerous. I've gone through the process and I've sat in on a few before I was on the um, commission. And so I think um, revisiting some of the, uh, some of these issues is, um, you know, it's, it's all about educating everybody and looking at the issues from different perspectives. And so Sue, I just like to thank you. And, and I, I thank the board for uh, considering this. Thanks, that's all. Thank you. All right, and that is all of our public commentators. Any additional comments or questions from the board? Mr. Dunn? Uh, thank you, Mr. Hurd. First of all, I would like to I would stand corrected. Uh, Steve Makauka made some excellent and very thoughtful comments and I jumped the gun in saying that they wouldn't be here and I apologize. Um, that said, I support the resolution and um, I, uh, I, I move that we support the, uh, the resolution proposed by Ms. Dr. O. All right. Do you have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Attorney Heim. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you, Ms. Rockstraw. Thank you. And thank you, Steve. All right. All right, so that takes us to Article 80. Resolution Facilities Department report clarify responsibilities, track progress of the Department of Facilities and Maintenance. Before we take this up, I'm gonna to go to the board briefly for comment on whether or not we'd like to take Ms. Thornton articles together or individually, um, just for guidance. <laughs> Mr. DeGorsi? Yeah, thank you. I, I think out of fairness for Ms. Thornton, if she's here, if, if she's comfortable with with um, going through all of them rather than have her wait longer and, and come back later. So if it's all right with her, I, I yep. think it makes sense well, to do all of them. She'll stay on for sure. I just, little feedback into my experiment into the, the consolidated hearing. So Ms. Thorne, if you're able to, what you can do is just run down the articles that you have before us, and then we'll turn to the board for any 
questions or comments that they have on any of the articles that you're proposing. Can I make a suggestion, uh, Mr. Chairman? Sure. Uh, first, first of all, I want to say in all gratitude. I mean, this is a this is a challenge to democracy, and you guys are rising to the challenge. And I am extremely grateful for your endurance. I I just really appreciate it. Um, rather, I want I've been thinking about how to go through this quickly, and there are these these five different resolutions are batchable. And what I'd like to do is take them out of numerical order and give them to you in batches and then let you ask questions and then take a vote at the end. Does that make sense? Yep, whatever you're comfortable with it. So we'll take separate votes on all of the articles at the end. Right, that would be, that would be terrific uh, because I'm not sure I can hold all five in my head sure. uh, at this point. So the first, First of all, my name is Barbara Thornton. I'm at 223 Park Ave in Arlington. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 16, I think. Uh, the, the first theme of the two, including two articles, 84 and 81, is um, I wanted to address the housing problems in Arlington. And I will preface this by saying that, that these were all prepared to come to you a year ago. And as I re-looked at them to bring them forward to this town meeting, um, I realized that, that I would think that they are all as important, if not more important than they were when I, when I brought them up a, a year ago. The first one, um, Article 84, is a is for the request that the Arlington Housing Authority come before town meeting and give a report, much like Mintman does and other organizations do that are important to the town and to particularly the legislative body of the town to understand what they're doing. Uh, we, we, Arlington Housing Authority provides critical services, the most critical services for affordable housing in Arlington. Arlington uh, affordable housing is a major discussion in Arlington. And uh, I would like to have the town, as people in the town are thinking about how to approach that issue, hear about all of the resources available, which includes the Arlington Housing Authority. So a nice invitation to them, suggesting talk about your budget, talk about your master plan. That is the resolution for, for Article 84. The related resolution, under the uh, theme of addressing the housing problems in Arlington stems from a meeting that was, or a, uh, a report that was done by the MIT students over a year ago for the Broadway corridor. And that report has become even more important, I think, as the governor's uh, transit communities uh, uh, discussion in, in recent legislation came up. That report suggests that we are going to be looking intensely at the housing issues in particularly in East Arlington and around the uh, Broadway, uh, around the main transit corridors and around Alewife. I suggest that we have a design competition and there are ways of doing that. Uh, there, are, there are organizations in the region that can provide us with architects and designers to come up with some designs and that will get the process moving in town because inevitably we are going to have zoning legislation a year on these issues and this will get the conversation started. So those are the two articles on housing and I'll stop there for any questions right. from, the, from the board. Board for any questions on article 84 or article 81. Mr. Dunn? Um, so I definitely uh, understand why, uh, my question is, is uh, why do this in the form of a resolution? Um, and so the question about uh, asking the, uh, the housing authority to, to speak to town meeting makes perfect sense. That's town meeting inviting another body and it's absolutely appropriate. The, on the competition, have you, have you approached like for instance the planning director or the town manager and asked hey would you do this separately without putting it before town meeting first um 
actually, no, I uh, remember this conversation went back to a year ago. So I don't remember if I talked to Adam Chaplin about it. I did talk recently to, to Aaron Zwerko about it. And I have been approached by an Arlington uh, resident, uh, Charles Blandy, who's at Tufts University, and he's bringing another team of students to me with his uh, negotiation class to talk about housing and to use this concept of, of, that we're going to be getting into about what kind of housing should we have as part of their negotiation class on behalf of the town. Okay. So, so I guess my inclination then is to either, uh, and I'm not, I am not making a motion right now, but my inclination would be to table this one and invite a conversation with the town manager or the planning director and see if we can get to an agreement without actually have, you know, putting it before town meeting. Or alternatively, I probably wouldn't be supporting it. I'm happy to support the one related to uh, the, the housing authority. Mahan? Um, try to be expeditious. Um, my comments would be exactly along the same lines as Mr. Dunn um, on the housing authority. We definitely in support of that. Um, uh, regarding the uh, planning department redevelopment board or the town manager, um, if perhaps those conversations through email or Zoom or some, some other way could happen and then um, see if this needs to continue with the resolution, that's sort of my line of thinking also. So I'm definitely on board with the uh, uh, housing authority invitation. Uh, I'm definitely on board with the sentiments of Article 81, but um, if we can sort of circumvent uh, not just the conversation, but uh, actually getting this done by, uh, if Ms. Thornton is uh, amenable to this, um, uh, speaking or communicating with the town manager vis-a-vis -vis, uh, planning department vis-a-vis -vis re redevelopment board. Um, th that's where I'm, I'm inclined to go. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Diggins? Yes, I me. Mean, I'm kind of on, feeling the same way as my, my colleagues, although I'm going, once again, I'm going to recommend that it go ahead to um, town meeting. But uh, for the HA, I mean, do they, do they issue a report of some sort to the state? I mean, they are uh, set up by the state. I mean, so is that information out there? There's no, they don't issue any kind of report or any. Uh, they may, I, have, I have actually reached out to people at the state and asked them what they know. And they said, well, you know, not a lot. So I could be, there could be reports that they give that are HUD required reports that are specific, but not like this is what we're doing in the town. It's more like this is how we spent the federal money would be my guess. I see, I see, okay. Compliance well, reports. Okay. All right. Uh, and and um and along the lines of the um the the design, yeah. I was I was wondering. So let's say we didn't have the resolution process. How would you go about getting that competition? I would go meet with Adam and meet with Jenny, and say this is such a great idea. And then I'd walk over to the to the um, oh, there the the foundation in Watertown where they have this stuff. And then I'd find some other people at MIT and Harvard that might do it. Yeah, I just like, as long as I had permission from the town and people wanted it done, I'd see what I could do to make it happen. All right, well, let's get started. And then, you know, at town meeting, if, if this should get by, you know, and, and you get to talk about it at the at town meeting, you can tell them what you're doing. Hey, Adam, and ask them to join, join in. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with the comments that Mr. Dunn and, and Mrs. Mahan made earlier. And uh, th th thank you for um, bringing these before us tonight. All right. So, do we want to take a motion now or wait for public comment as far as two articles? L looks like we're hearing a motion to approve one well, and motion to table another. My, yes, my motion would be uh, on the housing authority. Uh, my eyes are cross-eyed right now. Uh, to move approval to formally invite them a resolution uh, to 
formally invite them, uh, move approval on that. And the uh, second uh, Broadway corridor, uh, I don't wanna say competition, that we table that right now and allow Ms. Norton to have conversations with uh, the town manager and the planning director. So then? Uh, second both. All right. We'll open up to public comment. We have one, two hands raised. We have Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road. I wanted to uh, thank the proponent, Ms. Thornton, for proposing Article 84. The Arlington Housing Authority is an important organization, and just recently they started making their recordings of their meetings available Ooh. on ACMI, and they have uh, started to do many things that are really good, like including some of their uh, residents in their, in their governing process. Mm -hmm. However, I want to direct the attention of the board, even though it's late, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the notes supplied on Article 81. This is not the right way to do what the proponent hopes to do. Um, it talks about changing East Arlington along Broadway corridor to have units uh, 50 to 200 per building. 25% 25, 25 units in affordable housing, but that's what we already have, and it's area median income. So that would be for people potentially earning $100,000 or more. It talks about only really 75 to 100% one bedroom units. It talks about incredibly dense uh, a floor to area ratio of 3.2, no uh, height restrictions on building, waiving other residential zoning restrictions. This is a Trojan horse. And I would say to you, please, especially since the town meeting has voted no when they found out what density proponents like the proponent here were trying to push on us because they ruin our affordability. They hurt our anti-racist action. They remove uh, low and middle income people from Arlington and make it very difficult to move in. These kinds of, of actions are like a wet dream for developers. We really have to not do this as a, as a uh, motion of this sort. It should be completely open to debate in the town meeting. Thank you very much. Just a quick response. Those were, those were not. That wasn't a question. So, so we, we just got to continue with our um, public comments here. So Ms. Leone. Good evening again. Um, I, I would like to speak to Article 84. I can invite them this year. No use waiting for a resolution. I can formally invite them for the next annual town meeting, and we don't even need a resolution to do that. Uh, it's not a problem. They'll be invited this year. Mr. Thank you. Yes. Amy, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah. So did you hear? I just said I'll invite the Arlington Housing Authority this year. I have no problem doing that. We don't even need a resolution. Anything we can do to eliminate these resolutions from the town meeting, I'm a favor of because the way I look at it, each one's going to take 15 minutes. It's 16 of them. It's going to add three or four hours to town meeting for every resolution just to open it and vote it. So at least we can eliminate this one. So I'll formally invite them this year and every year hereafter. Can, can I just ask a question of Mr. Leone? Yes, briefly. Uh, can I work with you to, to word the resolution? I mean, you, to word the invitation? You can send me your thoughts. I think that's the same thing. Yeah, I'm not gonna let Is you write my letter. I'm not a lawyer, I'm always nervous. You, you, you can send me your thoughts and I'll write my own letter. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Ms. Kiesel? Uh, <clears throat> Hi, this is Laura Kiesel from Mass Ave Precinct 6. Um, I am a tenant at the Housing Corporation of Arlington and a Section 8 voucher holder with the Arlington Housing Authority. And so I, I do think it's a good idea to have the Arlington Housing Authority to present at town meeting. But the one question or concern I would have is I would also hope that that would be balanced with having 
some kind of solicitation of listening to the tenants. I think that several of the properties have tenants unions. And again, I know Arlington is having a lot of questions about equity. And I think it's important to also hear from those who actually live at the properties. Um, I know that they are starting to record the meetings and there've been a lot of concerns about maintenance issues, other things that aren't being addressed. Um, I'm hoping that Barbara Thornton has solicited some input from AHA voucher holders in Arlington and tenants as well in considering this, because I think that that would be a good thing for town meeting also to hear. Um, I recently watched the town meeting um, recording from when the Affordable Housing Trust Act was voted on, and I saw that some AHA tenants were on the list to speak, but um, debate got shut down before they could even be heard from. And so no one who was actually a renter, and particularly a renter living in affordable housing, was listened to on that issue. Regarding the Broadway um, article, which I don't know much about, but I will say that I also recently watched the Arlington Human Rights Commission panel on housing and equity. And toward the end, this came up and Connor Ring, who is part of a tenants union uh, renter here in Arlington and is an activist with City Life Vita Urbana, mentioned that if we're going to be developing Broadway or East Arlington Mass Ave corridors, it would be really important to also survey and listen to the renters and tenants and see what their concerns might be and how their rents are going to be impacted and their displacement concerns. So I also hope that will be considered or balanced in any of these articles. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kepka. Ms. Kepka, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Hi, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, this is Asha Kepka, Precinct 1. Um, as a East Arlington resident, I would like to um, ask that you consider um, greater input for, to uh, when it comes to making decisions on um, starting design group uh, competition um, from East Arlington residents. Um, we are very concerned about uh, redevelopment of Broadway um, corridor. And um, I even hosted one of the groups from MIT um, last year, year and a half ago. And we gave them a lot of input and I don't believe our input was being considered uh, in their design proposal. So um, I do urge you that you actually, before you even start any planning, um, designs, uh, you do ask residents for the input. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. And that is all our public commentators. Do we have any additional comments from the board? Mr. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Uh, I'm going to re reverse um, my vote on the resolution. I think that the, the moderator has solved the question about the housing authority. All right. So we have a. And uh, I would say it's um, same thing on 84. Seems like the moderator is going to take that action. I'll I think, remove I think my vote. Dan was taking out his second. So you're. No, no. I, I made the motion to approve yeah. 84 and table 81. So now I'll make the motion to withdraw from 84, joining with Mr. Dunn, who okay. seconded my motion. All right, any additional comments? So um, Mr. Hurd, for the sake of clarity, I move, we recommend no action on 84. I think that's right, what you were intending, Ms. Mahan, correct, right? You were changing your yeah. motion to no action. Uh, then I second, just, I'm, I just want to be really yeah. clear, but I'm happy to second it. All right. No, no, no. If, if Mr. Dunn wants to make that motion, <laughs> God bless, I'll second it. All right, I've already moved on. <laughs> Attorney Hyams, we you, have- You decide, you decide. Dan and I can go back and forth, you decide. I got it. So uh, on the motion to table um, the design corridor article, Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. 
Unanimous vote to table. On the motion to, I'm sorry, Mr. Hart, I don't mean to. On the motion uh, with respect to the uh, uh, invitation of the Housing Authority of no action, Mrs. Mahan. Yeah. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. I will record that the board is essentially taking the representation of the moderator and that the moderator will to receive input from, as, as generously offered to receive input from Mrs. Thornton. All right, and Ms. Thornton, which articles did you wanna present? 82 uh, and 83. Uh, the themes uh, that tie these two together are they strengthen the paths for productive citizen engagement. And okay. I. Yep, you can go ahead and present those two articles. Uh, the article, article 82 is to encourage a voluntary process where the uh, practice of town meeting changes a little bit and, and I've had conversations uh, back and forth in the email with with uh, Mr. Leone about this article and I think that um, I think there are ways I, I know he's concerned about the losing his prerogatives and I don't intend that at all but I think there are ways of simplifying the process around the one or two very contentious issues that come before town meeting that have a lot of moving parts. So I'm not talking about every article. I'm talking, and I'm not talking about lining people up in front of microphones to, on for the fors and the against. I'm talking about giving people that are proposing things in town meeting that are complicated an opportunity to break up their their presentations so that that people can take part A, part B, part C, and all three parts are heard for the pros and for the cons, and that either uh, Mr. Chapdelaine or Ms. Rate or somebody like that uh, identifies those issues that before they come up and, and tells Mr. Leone about it ahead of time. And he either calls on those six people alternately, or he says, I'm reserving 20 minutes for those three people to come up and talk and the other three people to come up and talk so that the town meeting knows that everything has, the main issues have been heard on these contentious issues. Okay. That's 82. All right. 83 is, uh, and I think we've all sat through some, some testy meetings where people are not as, as uh, civil and, and collegial as, as one might wish. Um, and that's, that's what happens in a democracy. Uh, but I think that there are ways when you have a lot of committees and a lot of people meeting and everybody is, is working on the best interests of the town, but things kind of get out of control. If there is somebody in each of the meetings that is trained in facilitation and in, and in setting an agenda and helping that meeting go through smoothly. So this is, a, this is uh, requesting that the town attempt to assign uh, facilitation skills or train somebody in every one of the meetings that's set up in town. Somebody's there with facilitation skills that have been provided through the town. That's 83. So those are that is the summary of the strength and paths for productive citizen engagement. And I will turn to the board for any questions. Mr. Diggins. Thank you. Um, so the, um, the, the latter one, was that the one that had a limit on the number of committees? Oh, I wanted to do that, but that didn't go through. You're probably remembering something. I, 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 when I talked to Doug Heim about this, I said, maybe we could just say, we're only gonna have seven committees in town and that would make things simpler, but that didn't, I don't think I got down the stairs before thinking that. Really okay, I thought it was like the, the limit of the number of committees that could be proposed. In, um, yeah, in, no. In, 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 okay, all right, I, I did read something. I thought it was recent. In, um, so, so um, uh, hmm. well, once again, I mean, it's like, what can we do now? 
uh, with, with respect to the um, me creating the facilitation uh, while well, creating a training for facility or having people train to be good facilitators. I mean, what can we do now? I mean, what would you what, what would you do if this warrant, I mean, if this article doesn't pass? There's training out there, but if the town meeting doesn't feel like it's important, I don't think there's anything that I can that I can do. And and the I've talked with uh, uh, Julie Brazil about this. Um, a year and a half ago now, a year ago, and I and I've talked with other people as well. There's there's training available, but if the bulk of people in town meeting don't believe that it's important or that would be even useful to have that training, I don't think any committee is going to pick it up. Somebody somebody in the town has to say to the committees, you know, this is a this is a policy that we want to try and implement. Here are three ways you can get trained. Can you make sure that one or two people in your committee are trained? Uh, the training takes, you know, three hours, four hours, whatever. Please do it. I don't think it can be done without a resolution. So you don't think the town can can well? Well, how would how would it work if the if it if the resolution passed? I mean, so then what would the town what would the town do? Well, then the town would have it. It is a little bit intrusive. Um, and without without the, the legislative body saying to the executive body, we agree this is an important thing to do. I don't know that the executive body would make it a priority. Okay. Maybe they would. I mean, I think the executives in this town have suffered more than anybody from the from the discord. Uh, hmm. All right, um, and, and I mean, I'm just f f suffering like massive short-term memory failure. What was the first one again in this? In, this, in this group, the, the first one was to encourage the voluntary process between, uh, let's say, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine and Mr. Leone sitting down and saying, on town. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I, I, I'm just I gonna wait because I, I see Mr. Leone's hands raised, so I'll just sit back and watch that one. So, uh, thanks. This is Mahan. <laughs> oh my lord. Oh, after these two articles, I, I'm gonna need like another five minute break, honestly. Um. Uh, I. I on um is it the collaborative training citizen review um i'm i'm, I'm really not in favor of that uh so i would move no action on that and then i would be interested in hearing from um the town moderator regarding the uh discussion around people speaking or citizen initiative. Uh, but right now my brain's kind of fried. So after we do these two, I need like a five minute break. So uh, th that's where I'm at. I, I would move no action on, on the previous one and would like to hear from uh, Ms. Thornton, the town moderator and the one, two, three, four people that want to speak on this. Does which it includes make sense? postpone all of this i mean well we have we're going to have busy agendas for a while um so while we're in this i think we should at least roll through i know i i i, I appreciate that i just feel like i've been carrying this for over a year and it's now midnight and nobody uh, i can't focus i'm sure everybody's having a hard time focusing so that would be subject to a motion from the board. So right now I'm just going to go through the board members for any comments. So Mr. Dunn. Uh, I'm, I'd like to hear the public. I would like to finish these two. And then I think uh, I would be uh, very interested in a motion to move on uh, to postpone the rest. All right, Mr. Corsi. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear from Mr. Leone as well on, on article 82 and, and on article 83, 
I, I, I see the intent that, that you're bringing up there, Ms. Thornton, and, and the issues that may arise on various committees, but I almost look at that as something that perhaps is looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and there, there may be a particular committee where they may need some assistance, and, and it, it can be offered, but I'm not sure I uh, would support a, a blanket um, resolution to, to provide that type of training uh, to every committee. All right, we will look to the public for input. This is a public hearing. We have our moderator, Ms. Leone. Hi, back on. Yep. Good evening for the third time. Um, I would like to speak to both of these, uh, 83 three extremely briefly. I'm not even sure a town meeting has the authority to direct other committees on how to act uh, besides setting them up and saying who their members are and setting their, um, their um, guidelines and guidance, their, their mission statement. Beyond that, I don't think we can tell them how to conduct themselves or what training they should or shouldn't take. So I think if this is gonna go through, it would be a bylaw from the select board and not a town meeting resolution. On 84, um, oh, excuse me, 82. Yeah, I'm getting a little tired myself. Um, I'm against this one, uh, flat out. The way the town meeting actually works is we don't do pre, uh, people calling up and getting on some sort of secret list beforehand, even if it's a, not a secret list. We're an open town meeting, the way it an op a representative open town meeting, the way it works is the proponents, I reach out to proponents or they reach out to me and they say, I'm the proponent, I want to have first up and they get it, but they get their seven minutes. They're not going to come up in batches of six people and seven minutes each. If the proponent wants their time, they have to request it right up front and ask the town uh, meeting for permission to extend over their seven minutes. Um, and it is often the case, Ms. Thornton, that they split their time up between different speakers and we allow that um, as of right, as long as they're within their seven minutes. Um, I'm often contacted beforehand by opponents of an, an article and I, I do look for them to raise their hand. This is, it would be against the way town meeting has always conducted itself, and at least in the time that I've been there since, you know, early 90s, 93, 94, and the way town meeting has always functioned. Uh, the bylaw or the notes that you've picked out, which I have up here on my screen at least, um, are from the town of Brookline. Brookline does conduct their town meeting differently than us, just as Lexington conducts it differently. They have pro and con speaker microphones, and they have neutral microphones. We don't do that. We don't have people line up. Um, one of the reasons we don't do that is for fear, at least um, my, my belief in the people, if there are 15 people at the pro microphone, someone may not get up and speak against something out of intimidation by the other speakers. I've always believed that, and I think it's a truth. Um, that, so the way they function their town meetings is different from ours, and that's why these uh, moderator rules in other towns would allow for this pre-registration. And frankly, um, whether Mr. Chapdelaine or Ms. Rate shouldn't be interfering with the way town meeting functions and taking speaker lists, that would be a, a job that the moderator would have to do on top of his or her own daily job. Um, it's just gonna add complexity to the moderator's life. It's gonna add, um, I think, a feeling of hardship among the town meeting members. If a stream of people get up and speak, and even before the town meeting members who were there and have raised their hand have had a chance to speak, they could coordinate and say, all right, I'm gonna speak, then you speak, then you speak, then you move the question. Um, even before the other side has the possibility and it's always up to the town meeting to vote to accept a motion to terminate debate or move on. But, you know, let's face it, after a long night such as this for you guys, someone gets up and moves the question, it's gonna pass. And 
the one side who has had a coordinated campaign to get on that speaker list and make the speaker list controlled by their foresight um, isn't doing any justice or service to the town meeting or to uh, the democracy as I see it. Um, you've got to rely on your moderator to some extent to know the crowd. Um, I've been doing moderating in here since 2008. I've been a town meeting member since 94. I can tell who's going to speak which way to a great extent. They fool me sometimes, but I think we get a pretty fair debate the way it is. We get both pros and cons. I don't really think that this is needed, nor do I think it's a, um, a wise way to start regulating town meeting more than it already is. It, I'll bring this to the town meeting procedure committee, obviously, but um, I can't speak for them without a meeting of the procedure committee, which you'll be invited to. But I, I would urge the select board to uh, just vote no action on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road. Um, um, I appreciate the uh, um, moderator's comments just now. I have 15 or more years, I think, in town meeting history uh, behind me. And I just wanted to point out that despite the governor's new law, which uh, removes a lot of local control by making almost all votes down to 50%, the proposal by Ms. Thornton is the worst attack on local control and democracy for our town I've ever seen. Thank you. Mr. O'Connor. Good evening. Um, I must admit that I'm amused by this conversation. I realize that the November James O'Connor, a uh, former member of Precinct 19. I did relocate my official legal residence to Air, but I am um, an experienced assistant moderator and I agree with Mr. Wagner and with Mr. Leone as the current um, continuing member as of the Town Meeting Procedures Committee that the issue about regulating what town meeting members do since we are subject to the voters election is that we represent our precincts and any organizational training should come from precinct meetings, which I think one of our members, Mr. Diggins has been promoting uh, quite a bit. When we have precinct meetings, we discuss the warrant articles, we discuss procedures with new members. As somebody that's been involved with town meeting for 23 years, every meeting uh, opportunity I had, I talked with fellow members of our precinct to discuss the issues. But I think to um, address two issues. One, is this something that should be a resolution? Um, I, I have to say, I agree with Mr. Leone in that over the last several years, there's been a lot more resolutions coming from town meeting that town meeting really doesn't um, regulate um, its body other than to ask for a bylaw to set speaker limits. Um, and we've done so. But the representation of the membership really enables everybody to represent their particular viewpoints. And if you start regulating that, as Mr. Wagner said, you're disrupting democracy as it is. Um, I know we're all tired, but I also think we need to enable people's fair communication as members of the body. And um, I, I just really have concerns about how much you regulate and how much you suggest that one must be trained um, to act with the quorum. I mean, we're all grownups when we get represented. If we fail to do our job as a representative of our precinct, I would expect the voters to speak up and just like they can see our votes can say, I don't feel it's appropriate that you get reelected. But 
to try to legislate that um, and to create a resolution that I think, as Mr. Leone has pointed out, when our town meeting procedures Mr. committee. Hunter, you're just at three minutes. If you can okay. Uh, I'll just close by saying I agree that um, this, th this is going too far. And I would hope that um, we can find another way to demonstrate um, better representation if people are concerned. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, um, we're past 12 o'clock. Yep. So if we want to go further, we have to waive the 12 o'clock rule. I, I will just say to everyone, and I usually don't bear, I have to be up at 4.30 to start administering the three disabled family members that live with me, injections and medicines at 4.30. So I really can't last much longer because I legit can't sleep to five, six or seven. I, I need to get up at four o'clock. So um, I'm not going to waive the 12 o'clock rule. If somebody else does, I'll abide by that, but I, I can't stay much longer because um, Attorney Heim can I, correct me, but I think we, it's an 11 o'clock rule, which we just open it up into perpetuity. Right, but, that, but then when we get to 12 o'clock, if we go beyond that, we need to wait for 12 o'clock midnight rule, um, which I'm not doing. So, uh, Attorney Heim? I think that the board has traditionally set a parameter for uh, how long it extends. If, if somebody, I'm not... I'm not 100% familiar with where that rule is codified, but my understanding is has been traditionally that you guys take another vote to keep extending. All right. What, what we've done the past two, three nights that we've been at midnight, Mr. Kiro's waived the 12 o'clock rule and we've gone to like quarter of one. I just can't do that again, um, but I'll, I'll be guided by my colleagues. All right. Does anyone want to make an additional motion on this? Mr. Diggins? I mean, I think we can probably wrap this up in 15, 20 minutes, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Mahan. Would that be okay with you? So, I mean, I think where we are is we have two more public commentators and then we'll take a vote and then we'll entertain a motion when we wrap up this particular article if we want to table the remaining warrant article hearings. Thanks, Mr. Chair, that's what I, I was getting at. I think we're around five to seven minutes left on these two articles that we have in front of us. So we'll go to Beth Malovchek and we dropped one. Okay. Sorry about that. Ms. Malovchek, is your name and address for the record? Beth Malovchek, Russell Street, um, town meeting member. I, um, I support Carl Wagner's statements and I heartily support the commentary of the town moderator and the assistant town moderator. Um, I think suggestions of regulating our municipal elected deliberative body would be anti-democratic. Thank you. All right, Rebecca Gruber. That was the last speaker on the public comment. Ms. Gruber, you have to unmute yourself. I'm just going to speak briefly about the other warrant, Article 83. Um, I'm very much afraid that this warrant will have unintended consequences. Um, I should say my prior career, I delivered corporate education to Fortune 500 companies. And I have conducted training in both facilitation and on getting to yes negotiations. So I'm a huge believer in the value of this type of training. And if the town has the resources to offer training to committee members who want it, that would be great. 
But it's been my observation of the many town meetings I've attended over the last several months that for the most part, town meetings are remarkably well run. The town residents who generously volunteer their time, like tonight, to be on these committees are dedicated to successful efforts and the results of their committees. And on the very few occasions when a meeting has resulted in conflict or discourse has been problematic, my experience has been that the committee regrouped and established or recommitted to group norms to ensure that meetings resume in a productive, congenial manner. And this is to be expected from people who volunteer their time to work towards the greater good of Arlington. I would suggest that any effort to completely avoid conflict like this Warren article attempts to do would not increase productivity, but would rather result in decreased productivity as discourse and exchange would likely be overly constrained. And even worse, it might discourage town residents from volunteering to serve on these committees and cause current committee members to resign. Town residents who are made to feel that they lack the professional skills and motivations to work effectively with their fellow residents are unlikely to want to provide their expertise, their energy, their time to work for the benefit of Arlington. In short, I don't believe this Warren article is necessary and more importantly, could potentially have a negative effect on the ability of Arlington to tap into one of its greatest resources, its resident volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll close our public participation. Um, so I'll open up the board for motion on articles 82 and 83. Would anyone like to make the motion? Mr. Dunn. I move, uh, I recommend no action on, I move that we, uh, on both articles. We have a second. Second. Any additional comments, Ms. Diggins? Uh, well, I I feel that a, I I'm I'm not saying that we should mandate uh, um, training you need to be a good facilitator, but I think it'd be good to make that available. And I understand that that may be something that the select board should take up because I know that I would I would take it you know, uh, because I feel <laughs> I'd probably take it every time it was offered because I feel that things would change me and it'd be good to have some insights as to how I could do better if I were you know, in a position of facilitating. Uh, and um, with respect to the lineup of speakers, there is something that is bothering, I think, most of us about the way we speakers mean are selected. We, uh, whether this process that we have is the best we can do, maybe that's the case. We, but clearly, there's something that bothers most of us about it. And I think we need to work some way to make people less bothered um, by it. I mean, so, so, look, I mean, I mean, lots of things we go before town meeting out of these resolutions that shouldn't. And, uh, I have problems with the resolution process, but as long as we have it, I mean, um, I'm gonna let them go. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. My brain is just like really twisted right now. So I, 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 uh, I believe Mr. Dun Dunn's motion was seconded. If it wasn't, I would second it and um, I'll, I'll talk to the chair tomorrow or the next day about um, if we keep doing these marathon after midnight nights or if we can do like a, a day, you know, a 10 to 4 thing during the day to get this stuff done. Because I, I, I feel for myself personally, I'm not, you know, once I get beyond 11 o'clock, I'm not the same Diane Mahan I am at 7 o'clock. And that's just not fair to these proponents that also are staying up this late. So if someone seconded Mr. Dunn's motion, that's fine. If they haven't, I would second it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. All right, Attorney Heim, we have a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. This is Mahan. Sorry, Attorney Heim, yeah. you need to have, take them separately? I'll do, um, I'm sorry, I'll do uh, 83 first. Is that what? 82. 82. Uh, on a motion to action on Article 82, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. No. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. 
to uh, four to one vote. And on um, Article 83, on a motion of no action, Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. No. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurt. Yes. It's a four to one vote. All right. And so thank you, Ms. Thornton, um, for participating. We're going to entertain a motion to table the hearings on Articles 80, 87, 88, 90, and 91. So moved. Second. All right, Attorney Hyde. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. We have correspondence received. Road safety concerns, Stephen Chong, 104 Lancaster Road. Overnight parking concerns, Eamon Keating. 65 Freeman Street, number two, and Blossom Street dedication for Alan Hoverness, Ara Gazarians, Armenian Cultural Foundation. Move or seat. Second. Second. <laughs> Any time? This is Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Do yeah. business. Attorney Heim. None of business. Mr. Chapterlane. I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Mr. Dunn. Thank you all for the pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for being Mr. Diggins. Welcome aboard. And, uh, and, and maybe you know, uh, uh, we have shorter, more frequent shorter meetings at night. Thanks. Mr. Corsi. No new business. Mrs. Mahan. Uh, stay for the chair, unless you have new business, I'd, I'd move to adjourn. Second. Do a second. 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 <laughs> attorney Thank Hyde. you, This is Mahan. Yes, thank you, Lord Jesus. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. I'm, I'm legit up in like three and a half hours. I'm not even kidding. Not that you guys aren't, but God bless you and good night. So long. Take care, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night.